Mr. Mayor, we're now live. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, due to COVID-19 emergency declaration, this meeting of Ajax Council is being held electronically and live streamed on the town's website. All members of council in attendance are participating by audio and video conference and senior town staff are available throughout the meeting if council members have any questions on the agenda. For members of the public watching from home, please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties throughout the meeting. And I'll now call this meeting to order. I'd like to begin this meeting by acknowledging the land on which we gather is situated within the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island and the Chippewas of the Anishinaabeg, known today as the William Treaties First Nation. This place is and will continue to be home to Indigenous peoples. Let us move forward together with kindness and respect. Does any member of council have any pecuniary interest before we get started? Hearing none, I have a motion moved by Councillor Tyler Morin, seconded by Councillor Lee. The council convened to a closed session pursuant to section 239 slash paragraph two paragraph K of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended to discuss a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. Can I have any questions on that? Hearing none, those in favor of going into closed session? Any opposed? I see no hands, that's carried.
That's a lot of crap. Mr. Mayor, we're now live. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, I have a motion here, moved by Councillor Dye, second by Councillor Lee, that all directions approved in the closed session be ratified. Questions or comments? Seeing none, those in favor? Ratification? Any opposed? None opposed, that's carried. Adoption of the minutes. I have moved by Council Tyler Moore and second by Council Bauer. The following minutes of previous council meetings be adopted. The regular meeting of September 21st, the closed session of September 21st, the special meeting of September 28th, the closed session of September 28th, and the special meeting of October 5th. Any questions, comments, errors, omissions on the minutes? Hearing none, those in favor of approval of the minutes? I see all hands, none opposed, that's carried. Mr. Clerk, uh, I understand that no member of the council, is, no member of the public has submitted any questions or question period? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to delegations, we have Durham Regional Police Service West Division update from Inspector Mitch Martin, DRPS West Division Inspector. When you're ready, please go ahead. Are we having technical issues, Mr. Clerk? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Inspector Martin is connected. However, I don't think his microphone is connected right now. All right, we'll give him another minute. Want me to text him? He is reconnecting. There we go. Mr. Clerk, do you think we should move on to the presentation? Through you, Mr. Mayor, if you wish to proceed with the next item on the agenda and return to 6.1 at a later time, uh, that would be something that you could do. Um, well, we've given them a couple of minutes. Why don't we, if it's okay with council under our new procedural bylaws, modify the agenda and we'll move on to item 6.2 and we'll go back to 6.1 after. Are we okay with that? Okay, item 6.2 vision zero update is uh, Mr. Kemp ready to go from the region and Amanda Spencer? Looks like they are. Yes, I'm here. All right, please proceed when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, for that introduction, and good evening, uh, members of council, staff, and uh, and guests. Um, Amanda and I are uh, happy to be here with you tonight, virtually, to uh, go through a short presentation um, that's been a while in the making. We've tried to, uh, we were originally scheduled to bring this to you back in back in uh, March, um, but uh, obviously things didn't quite go as planned. So um, yeah, just a short presentation to run through. And just before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, the efforts of uh, Regional Councillor Crawford on our uh, Vision Zero 
uh, task force that has really helped us over the last year to, to, uh, to move this program forward. Uh, next slide, please. I don't think I can advance it. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I always like to start off with a little bit of good news. And um, this, uh, I won't spend too much time on this graph, but but uh, essentially what it shows is that the number of fatalities in the province of Ontario has, has been on a pretty steady uh, decline, despite a, a rise in the number of uh, licensed drivers in the province. So uh, we've had a pretty good, uh, pretty good run over the last 20 years or so, and uh, advancements in vehicle technology, all kinds of things have contributed to this. So um, it's, uh, it, it's a, it's somewhat of a, a good news story, although if you look closely at the graph, you'll see it's a, it's a little flatter towards uh, in the outer years, and uh, we still think we can do better. So next slide. So what is Vision Zero about? Um, I'm sure many of you have, have, uh, have heard um, a lot about it before, but it's a program that uh, originated in Sweden. Um, it's a little different than a traditional North American approach towards road safety. And there's three fundamental uh, pillars or, or principles. Um, one, that no one should be killed or seriously injured as a result of a motor vehicle collision. Everybody needs to make it home safely at the end of the day. Two, um, it's not good enough to say that human error is contributing to these incidents anymore. And as engineers, we need to make sure that our designs um, are, are done in a way that accommodates the fact that humans will continue to make mistakes. So we need to make our designs as forgiving as possible so that when those mistakes do occur, um, it doesn't result in a, in a human life. And finally, the third basic premise, premise is that collisions do not happen by accident. Every collision has a, has a cause and every collision has some aspect of it that if, if it would have occurred differently, um, uh, the collision wouldn't have had to exist. So there's always they're always preventable, and always things we, that we can do to uh, to get these numbers down. Uh, next slide. So uh, the vision, uh, as uh, evident in the title, Vision Zero, is that zero people are killed or injured across all modes of of transportation. Um, everybody needs to make it home safely at the at the end of the day. The most common reaction when we tell people, say this to people is, is uh, let's say zero, really? Is, is, that, is that really possible? Um, and, and a lot of people um, you know, question that kind of very, very uh, principle. Um, we believe it is possible. We, we believe we were on that track. It may take us a long time to get there, um, but there's a lot of things that can help us continue to push that graph that you saw on my earlier slide uh, right down to the bottom. Uh, next slide. So we know zero is not going to happen overnight. So we've established some interim uh, goals. And our goal for the first five years of our Vision Zero plan is to achieve a minimum 10% reduction in uh, fatal and injury collisions over that, that time period. So that's our, that's our first goal. At the end of the plan, we'll reassess where, where we are and uh, move forward from there. So with that, uh, if Amanda is on the line, I'd like to turn uh, the next portion of the presentation over to her. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Amanda Spencer. I'm the uh, project manager of the Road Safety Group. I uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. Okay, okay. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so based on a combination of public input and collision data analysis, the technical working group identified these eight emphasis areas to be addressed through the plan. Intersections, aggressive driving, distracted driving, young drivers, pedestrians, impaired driving, cyclists, and commercial vehicles. Next slide, please. The collision data in this bar chart summarizes the fatal and injury collisions from 2012 to 2016 for all regional and local municipal roads combined. 
Each emphasis area is represented along the bottom of the graph against the total number of collisions on the y-axis. It is it's evident from the graph that majority of fatal and injury related collisions occur at intersections and or are associated with aggressive driving. The next few slides will highlight a few of the improvements we have undertaken in 2019, 2020 to target each of these emphasis areas. Next slide. We know from the data that 68% of the total collisions occurred at signalized intersections. Some of the 2020 countermeasures are listed here. In the interest of time, I will only highlight uh, protected only left turn phasing, uh, which isolates left turn movements, eliminating any potential conflict with oncoming through vehicles and pedestrians. Next slide. On average, aggressive driving represents approximately 56% of total collisions. A few of the 2020 countermeasures we are targeting for aggressive driving are ASC or automated speed enforcement, which Steve will discuss in a bit, um, and altering the road design to discourage speeding, such as uh, decreasing lane widths, reducing the design speed, installing raised median islands and constructing edge line or center line rumble strips, for example. Distracted driving is the third highest emphasis area in terms of collision frequency. Approximately 1,975 fatal and injury collisions over five years were attributed to distracted driving. This number is likely higher as oftentimes it is difficult for officers to prove. Safety edge are an example of an engineering countermeasure that replaces the rounding at the edge of asphalt in rural areas with a more gradual slope to better help drivers recover back onto the roadway. Next slide. When assessing collision data by age, the age group from 16 to 25 is the highest represented. Several of our Durham Vision Zero task force members and road safety partners in Durham deliver annual education campaigns geared towards students and high schools, such as those listed in the slide. Next slide. Based on five years of collision data, approximately 800 fatal and injury collisions were recorded involving a pedestrian. Half of these collisions occurred at a signalized intersection. Therefore, some of our 2020 countermeasures have a strong focus on improving pedestrian safety at intersections, such as piloting a leading pedestrian interval, which holds traffic to give pedestrians advanced time to cross the road. Some other initiatives include installing pedestrian crossovers, which through the use of flashing beacons, signs, and specific line markings bring more attention to crossings. Next slide. Countermeasures are targeted at impaired driving through initiatives like the Festive Ride Program, Project Prom, and other great education and enforcement initiatives. Collision records indicate a continuous increase in cycling related collisions predominantly through the months of June, August, and September. 40% of cyclist collisions involve a rider aged 20 or younger. There are several initiatives underway. Some are noted here. Um, I'll just highlight um, the cross rides at intersections. We are installing combined cross rides at signalized and mixed cross rides at unsignalized intersections where multi-use paths connect. Next slide. Approximately 5% of fatal and injury collisions involved a commercial motor vehicle. However, 
Given the relative size and weight of these vehicles, they have a higher inherent risk to all other road users. Some of the 2020 countermeasures include signing and designated truck routes, continuing to increase the number of commercial vehicle checks and safety blitzes throughout Durham. Next slide. And uh, now I'll pass it back to Steve. Okay, thank you very much, um, Amanda. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to share with you some AJAX specific um, data. And uh, the map that you're looking at on the slide uh, represents uh, five years of collision data, 2014 to 2018. Um, and it shows the, uh, the dark blue circles um, that are numbered are the highest, um, the 10 locations, uh, regional intersections within Ajax in terms of collision frequency. So Kingston Road and Salem Road, for example, which is ranked uh, uh, number one, uh, had 196 collisions over that five-year period. The other piece of data that you'll see in the table is an indication of where that intersection ranks overall uh, in terms of a region-wide uh, ranking. So um, uh, as an example, Bailey and Harwood in the table is uh, the fourth highest regional intersection collision uh, intersection in Ajax, but overall within the region, it's number 20. Um, so what you'll notice is that uh, Ajax unfortunately has, uh, has the unfortunate um, circumstances of having the two uh, uh, highest collision uh, frequency locations in the region, uh, Kingston and Salem being number one and Kingston and Westney uh, being uh, number two. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this next slide, um, a similar map. Um, but I wanted to focus in on the light blue circles, uh, which again are the uh, the highest 10 uh, collision frequency locations in Ajax. But in this instance, in this instance, uh, we're talking about local municipal roads, so Ajax roads. Um, all of this data comes from DRPS. Um, so you can see Harwood and Roslyn. Uh, generally, the the Harwood corridor. Uh, uh, represents uh, the highest local municipal collision locations uh, within Ajax. Uh, next slide. Uh, a couple projects to highlight. Um, thanks to uh, thanks to this council and uh, working um, uh, working together, we managed to get a traffic signal installed at the intersection of Westney Road and Millington, uh, activated on the 27th of August this year. Um, we're currently working on a traffic signal installation at Rosland and River Glen, River Glen for the town. Uh, we implemented automated speed enforcement in front of uh, on Bailey in front of uh, uh, the high school, uh, activated on September 8th of this year. Uh, and we recently activated one of the region's first uh, red light cameras at the intersection of Westney and Delaney, and it was activated on the 25th of September. Next slide. So a little bit of detail about the ASC program or automated speed enforcement. Um, we captured, uh, to date we've captured over 100,000 images uh, by the devices. Uh, the region has implemented four mobile speed camera uh, units. Um, uh, at the uh, Bailey ASC site alone, we issued over 1,000 uh, fines at that location. Uh, and we saw a significant reduction in, in uh, speeds over the time period that the camera was uh, in place. Um, we're currently working very closely with, uh, with John Greve of uh, Ajax staff, uh, working with him to uh, provide some advice on how to uh, roll out um, the program further on uh, residential streets, local, local municipal streets within, within Ajax. Next slide. Uh, just some preliminary data from the Bailey site. Um, we have we, we have tried many many things over the last 20 years to reduce speeds on on our on our streets. Um, I have never seen a trend like this before. It's clear that automated speed enforcement worked, um, and we saw a significant reduction in speeds over a pretty short period of period of time uh, when the camera uh, was in place. Next slide. 
Um, hopefully, uh, no one on the uh, at the meeting has had the opportunity to see one of these yet. Um, but this is what the offense notice um, offense notice looks like. Uh, the camera captures uh, an image of the rear plate of the vehicle, and an offense notice is sent to the uh, registered owner, um, along with the uh, information that shows you the posted speed limit in the area and the speed of the vehicle that was captured, along with the date and time that the incident occurred. Next slide. Uh, red light cameras, as I mentioned, the camera at Westney and Delaney was activated on the 25th of September. Uh, in the week prior to uh, activating the site, we captured 184 images at the location, uh, just in a one week, uh, one week period. And uh, the camera is operational uh, today. Next slide. Uh, again, just a sample of what the offense notice uh, looks like. Uh, with that red light cameras, uh, the camera captured two photos, one of the vehicle uh, behind the white stop line, one of the vehicle past the white stop, stop line, and then a, uh, an enlargement of the, uh, of the vehicle plate. Uh, and again, the offense notice is sent to the registered owner of the vehicle that, uh, uh, that committed the offense. Next slide. So what are our next steps? Um, Continued implementation of the countermeasures that Amanda described in each uh, emphasis area. Uh, continued partnership and collaboration with, uh, we're working very closely with uh, Durham Regional Police and the local area municipalities to implement these programs. And ongoing monitoring and evaluation um, as we work towards our, our goal of, uh, of achieving zero. Uh, if you'd like more information, there's a link at the bottom of the slide and our contact information is provided as follows. Um, and then Amanda and I would be happy to take any questions. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I have Councils Crawford, Tyler Morin, and Lee so far. Crawford, go ahead, and I see Bauer now. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen and Amanda. It has, it has been a privilege to work with you. I've learned a ton of stuff over the last couple of years. Um, Amanda, could you just touch on uh, distracted driving uh, and what it means to be texting when you're at a stoplight? And perhaps maybe even one of the examples of the Whitby site uh, over the past year. Do you remember the one I'm talking about? Uh, yes, I do. I believe it was Dixon and Danda. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so uh, I'll start with that. Uh, the Thixton Danda site, they uh, working with DRPS. Uh, uh, DRPS set up a, um, a few officers um, who um, were set up around the intersection to um, specifically look for drivers that were stopped at a red light um, and using their cell phones. Um, a lot of drivers especially <laughs> are surprised to hear that when you're stopped at a red light and you're using your phone it's still a distracted driving offense. So um, I'll just say that the DRPS received some very unhappy <laughs> response from that uh, initiative. Uh, however, they did, uh, they couldn't keep up. They, they were inundated with, uh, with the number of people doing this. And so in that respect, it was successful. However, unfortunate um, that distracted driving, although we keep putting that message out there, it's just, it's not getting through. It's not resonating with people. So um, we hope um, when the weather <laughs> gets nicer and, and hopefully COVID goes away, we can get out there and do some more of those blitzes. Um, we were even uh, contemplating putting up a camera to help DRPS with that initiative. So um, yeah, so the, I hope that answers your question. Because I think they gave out somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 tickets in a very, very short period of time. Is that correct? Yes, it was it was something in that magnitude. I can't recall exactly, but I know they did a few other ones in Oshawa too on King Street um, in downtown Oshawa, which was also seeing a lot of violations as well. 
Right. So Stephen, with the, um, I understand now the automated speed enforcement camera has been removed from Bailey. Uh, what types of uh, monitoring will be done? We've had such great success of reducing it by 30% in such a short period of time is amazing. So what kind of uh, monitoring will, will continue in that area? Yeah, I can, um, um, I can answer that. So um, although the, the camera has been re relocated to one of the next uh, sites, um, we do continue to collect uh, speed information from all of the traffic that is passing by that point. Um, so we have other equipment in place uh, that's uh, mounted at the side of the road that's measuring uh, the speed of every vehicle. And um, what we want to see is what happens now that the camera is, is gone. So um, we're expecting to see some rebound in the, in the uh, travel speeds coming back up. Um, but we're we're counting on there being some kind of uh, permanent uh, permanent effect. Um, but we're going to monitor it very closely, see uh, what happens, um, and uh, using this data to help us inform decisions that we're going to make in the future about um, options to expand the program, uh, options to consider permanent or fixed uh, fixed location devices, those those kinds of things. All of the data we're going to collect is, is to help us um, decide where to go next. Um, okay, Mr. Chair, I have two more questions. Is that okay? You have the floor. Okay. Uh, my second question is um, the uniqueness of the Delaney and Westney uh, red light camera. It is, it is unique to other locations. And could you explain that for us? Sure. So um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but originally we in had intended to install the camera at Westney and Totten Road. Um, but because of uh, planned construction activities, we decided to, uh, um, to put that location off uh, until uh, potentially the next round of expansion. So we looked for another site within Ajax and that's how we ended up at, uh, at Westney and Delaney. Um, the thing that's unique uh, or somewhat unique about that location is that uh, in the northbound direction, it has a shared uh, through and right turn lane. So there is not a designated right turn lane at that, at that intersection. Uh, and what that means for, uh, for red light camera operation is that um, at that particular site, uh, the camera can issue an, an offense notice for an illegal right turn on red uh, maneuver. Um, so in, in Ontario, uh, unless otherwise signed, it is legal to make a right turn on red as long as you come to a stop first. Um, but you cannot make a right turn on red uh, at speed. You have to slow down and then and stop at the stop bar and then make your right turn. So uh, during the week prior to the activation of the camera, we noticed quite a few right turn on red violations being captured by the device. Um, so we we uh, we worked with DRPS. Uh, we actually delayed the activation of the camera by a week so that the police could go out and do some education and and talk to motorists about um, about right turns on red in general and just make sure that they were aware that uh, that the, that intersection was a little bit unique compared to some of the others. Thank you. Um, my last question is, I love being number one and number two in Durham region, but not for intersections with the most collisions. <laughs> so I hope that you have something in your bag of goodies that's going to drop us down to the bottom of the, of the number pile for that one, because that is not a good thing to be bragging about. But thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Councillor Tyler Moore. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for the presentation, Amanda and Stephen. And for all your hard work with uh, Councillor uh, Regional Councillor Crawford, can you expand just a little bit on the 16 to 25? Or the age is the highest for distracted drivers, I believe you said, right? So I, I'm asking you just to see if there's any kind of, uh, as you said, uh, education or social media where they always are, where we always are. Um, any of those campaigns coming up in, in tandem with DRP for that age group, maybe in high schools on Instagram? Don't text it, you know, and all that. Amanda, can you take that one? Uh, yes. Uh, to be honest, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, typically, I believe uh, uh, DRPS launches a distracted driving campaign earlier in the year. Um, I okay. 
I'm not sure. I know we we are always trying to do education um, or sorry, uh, public campaigns um, through social media messaging and things like that. But uh, I know D DRPS does their larger sort of blitz, if you will. And I think it's at the beginning of the, every year. Okay, if you can maybe take it as a, as a suggestion because yeah. that age group is so vulnerable. Yeah. If, if, if I could just add, if, if I could just add, if you don't mind, um, I just wanna point out 16 to 25 uh, was not um, overrepresented at just for distracted driving, that group, that age group was overrepresented overall across all of the different categories. Um, and we also, um, maybe not that much of a surprise, you, you break the data down a little bit more. And clearly, uh, uh, young men are, uh, are, are overrepresented in the statistics compared to their population. Great. So it's not just, right, it's not just... Yeah. Girls texting, it's a, it's a wide variety of boys, girls. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Through the Chair regarding the presentation, how many deaths have we had in Ajax? Um, so you showed all those collisions at the major intersections regionally and locally. Uh, do you keep track of actual fatalities as a result of poor driving? Uh, through you, you know, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, today to answer your question, um, we, we tip like region wide, uh, we generally have between 20 and 30 fatalities uh, a year. Um, but I'm not sure how many of those occurred in, uh, in, in Ajax off the top of my head. I, I can get that data for you. Uh, that'd be great. Uh, not that I'm just, it just helps with. Um, giving perspective to numbers at our various town halls, for example. Um, speaking of the numbers, what was the COVID effect on your numbers? Because um, I imagine you didn't see as many drivers as you anticipated as a result of COVID keeping people indoors. Yeah, through me, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, there definitely has been um, a COVID effect. Um, we saw early on back in back in uh, March and April, we saw traffic volumes down uh, 60 to 70 percent on our uh, on our regional roads. Uh, those volumes have been creeping up since that time, and we're getting close to being uh, back at the level where we were before. Uh, we did see a substantial decrease in the number of collisions on our roads, um, but the number of uh, fatalities. Has stayed about the same, and and through our discussions with uh, with DRP, um, it's a little bit of speculation, but but the I think the consensus is um, that a lot of that may be due to the fact that speeds were were up. So although volumes were down, um, that that low volume uh, created some opportunities for people to behave badly in some instances, and. Uh, and that may have contributed to the severity of some of the, the collisions that did occur, um, but, the, but the numbers were definitely down. Um, my final question is um, the next steps. So you mentioned that, you know, we're gonna move the camera from Bailey, for example, and introduce possibly more ASE. Why wouldn't the top uh, intersection, which would be in my word, unfortunately, of Kingston and Salem be the top of that list? Yeah, so um, for speed enforcement, um, the, uh, the sites we pick for speed enforcement uh, generally would not be at an intersection because the speeds tend to be low. They would be between intersections. Oh, right. Okay. And, and yeah, Kingston Road, uh, the speeds are, you know, there are some sections where we have speeding issues, but, but um, congestion is our friend in terms of speed. So sometimes the, those sites are, are different. Um, red light cameras is a different story though. And um, and those those locations um, are definitely on our our radar for future implementation of uh, of red light cameras. Although um, the predominant collision type at those intersections are, are uh, left turn collisions, and red light cameras don't necessarily help with that type of problem. So we're we're looking at some other solutions there as well. And just quickly, um, could you give us an example of what those other solutions would be? You know, clearly we understand that left, left turns are the kind of the key cause for the accidents 
on a major intersection like Highway 2 in Salem, wh what are they doing in Sweden, for example, on a comparable road for left turns? Yeah, so like, I don't Amanda, know. I don't. I can't figure out what else could be done, but you know, you guys are the experts, so I'm just wondering okay. if you can give us a taste of what um, left turn mitigation would look like. Yeah, so Amanda mentioned uh, briefly uh, protected only left turn phasing. So we have uh, two trial locations, uh, one in Whitby and one in Pickering, uh, but potentially some more coming. Um, it's pretty common in other jurisdictions. It's a little bit rare for Durham, um, but it's basically changing the traffic signal operation so that uh, left turning traffic can only turn on a left turn arrow and they never have to they never have to deal with judging a gap in the opposing through traffic. And there's no opportunity for, the, for that left turning traffic to turn on an amber or a red indication. They can right. only turn on their green face. So the problem is, um, so it almost eliminates left turn collisions, um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's very inefficient from an operations perspective. So sometimes it creates other problems. So we have to be careful. Fair enough. Thank you very much for a completely uh, informative report and looking forward to some of the changes in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bauer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Stephen and Amanda, for this uh, very informative presentation. And thank you, Regional Councillor Crawford, for also for the passion that you have put into making this happen. We hear about it all the time. Um, so just following up on what Councillor Tyler Moran said about young drivers. So just so that I understand the numbers correctly, that 1,962 young drivers on the graph um, are involved in all of those types of the other categories, but they are their own set of numbers or are they double counted? Like they would not be included in the other categories. Oops. I, yeah, they, they, are, they are double counted. So um, the same collision could show up in that graph in three or four different bars. So if you had a, a 16 year old impaired driver and a collision at, a, at an intersection, that collision would show up three times. So they're not, um, they're not um, exclusive each, of each other. There could be duplication. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the story, you talked about the um, cell phones, how many people don't realize that if you're parked at a red light, you're still considered distracted driving if you're on your, if you're checking your cell phone. I'm just wondering if you've explored opportunity. Maybe that's and it's a matter of education. People don't know it. So is there opportunity there maybe to partner with uh, the cell phone carriers and maybe have a little note that I don't know how that would be marketing of some kind or have an education piece that you know this cell phone you cannot use it. Like it's against it's 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 illegal to do it to check even on a red light. I don't know if you if that would be something that you would consider thinking about. I, I don't think that's been considered before, but that's a, that's a great suggestion and something that we can, uh, that we can explore. Okay. Thank I'll you very much. much. Yep. I'll, I'll just add to, sorry, <laughs> that that's the whole premise of Vision Zero is that collaboration piece and reaching out to all various different road safety partners and working together for one common goal. So that, that's a good point. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Great. Thank you very much. That's it for me, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Dice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Collier. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's really very interesting, and I'm pleased that you came with us or came here tonight to uh, help us understand what you're doing, what you're working on. Those intersections that you speak of, and I know in particular the one at Bailey and Harwood has always been problematic. Um, and I think I remember there's been a couple of uh, attempts to realign the road because sometimes it's a matter of a vision issue when making a left-hand turn. It's not always a straight sort of um, intersection. It curves a little bit. So how going forward with these intersections, is that something that you take into consideration on how, impro how improvements could be done in the future to uh, make it a safer intersection? You, do you want to tackle that one, Amanda? Sure. <laughs> uh, yes. To, to answer your question, that that is definitely something what we'll, that we look at. Um, um, more recently, we've been um, uh, conducting a video conflict anal analysis, and uh, they set up a camera at the intersection, 
and they record near miss collisions. So that, that type of data really tells us what the problem is occurring at the intersection. And with that information, we can then move forward to address, address it. And, and like you mentioned in terms of some potential uh, sightline concerns with the curve, the horizontal alignment issue of an intersection, one of the countermeasures we're looking at is, is installing um, um, positive offset left turn lanes, they're called. So it takes a left turn uh, lane and it slightly shifts it so that you can see past uh, a left turn vehicle that's opposing you. Um, so it, it, it gives you a better sight line and also is very, uh, uh, good if there's a if a, there's a curve involved in the roadway. Oh, that that's great to hear. It's a, that's an interesting perspective to have the video analysis. I find the other issue is um, the vehicles are getting larger too, and that often obstructs your view and making a left hand turn. So thank you for the information. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you. That completes my speakers list. Anybody else before I ask a couple? I just have a kind, I won't repeat anything that was said. Just to Councillor Bauer, uh, your comment about the phones. Most of us, a lot of us have iPhones. I can't speak to the others, but there is a do not disturb while driving feature that you actually have to manually turn off. And in there, if I have it on, so as soon as it connects to the car Bluetooth, it's locked out. And you would actually have to override the setting to use it as a red light. It actually tells you, it appears you're driving. <laughs> so that does exist. It's just, I think a lot of people choose to turn it off perhaps. Uh, just to my questions, thank you for the presentation. Um, one of the things that uh, Ms. Spencer, you had said is 68% of accidents were at intersections. Does that signalize intersections or just all intersections generally? I believe the statistic refers to signalized intersections. Okay. That's what I thought, and, and, and as been pointed out by um, Council Property, we have two highest collision intersections. And when this red light camera proposal pilot first came to the region back in 2012, I think it was, I was a big supporter of it. It didn't go ahead because they were only looking at um, uh, T-bone collisions at intersections. They weren't looking at any other data for any other intersection, any other collisions. but it would have made sense for me for the pilot to put the red light camera in Ajax at one of those two intersections rather than it, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm sure they have an accidents at Westney and Delaney, but nowhere near as much as the others, they don't make the list. I'm just wondering the justification for that. Cause that's, that's kind of a, well, it's right around the corner from my house. It's kind of an out of the, out of the way place considering the volumes in other areas. Question mark. <laughs> Do you want me to try to take that one, Amanda? Sure. sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So when we selected the sites, uh, we looked at two things. We looked at uh, we did violation studies, which meant we sent people out to intersections across the region and had them uh, watch for uh, watch and record red light running behavior and uh, log that information over um, a week long. Uh, period. Um, and we also looked at uh, DRP collision data for a group of intersections. And the, and the two things that um, move Kingston, uh, Salem and Kingston, Westney further down our list uh, are, the, are the fact that we did not see a lot of red light running by vehicles going through the intersection. So uh, red light cameras do not capture uh, left turn violations, they only capture uh, a through vehicle violations. And we did not see a, red, a lot of red light running at those sites. Um, it, it's a bit of speculation, but our, our thinking is, and it's consistent what, with what we've seen at other intersections across the region too, is um, the risk of running a red light um, and the consequences of running an, a red light when you're going through an intersection like Kingston and Salem are, are so high 
that um, that people are pretty pretty vigilant and just you know really try uh, not to do it. So if you're going to push an amber indication as a driver, you're way more likely to do an intersection like Westney and Delaney than you are to do that same type of move at Westney and, and Highway Two. That's a bit of a, a speculation, but the data backed that up as well. We just did not we didn't see the red light running uh, happening when we did our our site visits. Um, the other thing we looked at was the collision data. Um, and you're right in your comments, we, we only looked at uh, T-bone type collisions. And that's because um, those are the types of collisions that happen when someone's uh, running a red light. So um, the only way a T-bone collision can happen at a traffic signal is if one of those vehicles uh, ran a red. So we did not look at left turn collisions. We did not look at rear end collisions, which, which tend to be the most common uh, collision type. Um, but we didn't look at those in our analysis because a red light camera really does not uh, do anything to address those collision types. And in some instances, some studies, uh, we even see increases in, in those collision types after the installation of a red light camera. So when we ranked all of those intersections, including the, the, you know, the major intersections along Highway 2, um, not just within Ajax, but but really a, across the region, we saw a lot of those major intersections that instantly come to mind for people as maybe being high risk locations. Um, we saw them trending towards not the very bottom of our list, but they weren't they weren't at the top. Okay. Well, well, respectfully, your data doesn't match my personal experience in those areas because I see people whether it's tandem dump trucks to buses to just tons and tons of cars right through. And I find it interesting you have that red light camera so you can catch people making a right-hand turn, which I'm not, I've never heard is a problem as far as complaints, but it can't catch a left-hand turn. Yeah, it's, it's through, through you, it's, it's, uh... It's, it's honestly kind of a technology limitation more than anything. And um, maybe at some point in the future, we'll, we'll have the ability to capture other, other types of red light running. Well, may I just, again, respectfully suggest that people won't know that it doesn't stop the red light turns or the left mm -hmm. turns on the red if you don't tell them. Just like people don't know that our cameras are only one direction. They're not every direction on the intersection if we don't tell them like I just Great. did. Great. So um, I would put it up as kind of the placebo effect, even if we can't catch them or not, I do believe it would have the effect of stopping because to me, that's almost more of a, an epidemic than, than the red light running is the three, four, five, six cars that bolt after the light turns red on the left mm -hmm. turn signal. Um, but I'll just, I'll just leave that with you. Just the automatic speed enforcement on Bailey, that 30% reduction, that jives with the, the study that was done out of New York regarding the, the automatic speed enforcement. Sorry, did I say red light cameras? The automatic speed enforcement. I, I imagine, is that consistent with what you've seen across the region, what you saw at Bailey? Uh, yeah, it's pretty consistent. At all four sites, we saw reductions in that. In that uh, in that range, and it is consistent with uh, uh, what's been seen across North America. Although, uh, like New York City, for example, has permanent um, permanent locations. So um, we're we're going to have to see uh, what happens out at on Bailey uh, this week and next, and and make some decisions from from there. That that camera has been moved. Um, it's not in Ajax anymore, is it? Yeah, that's right. We have 24 locations on our list region-wide, um, four cameras, and we're doing about a one month uh, stop at each site uh, as, part of our, as part of our program, as part of this pilot. Um, over time, we may, um, we may be recommending additional devices and, and even additional sites. That's my next question is, when does this pilot end and when will that evaluation take place? Uh, so the evaluation is is ongoing. It's happening now. Um, we uh, um, we're we're going to need um, you know at least three or four months worth of data. I'll probably be reporting back mid 
uh, uh, sort of mid mid next year with some recommendations on where to go next. Okay, I'm really glad to see that data. We have again been pulling our hair out trying everything, traffic calming everything we can to try and slow people down on our municipal roads. And we've got three automatic speed enforcement cameras starting in the new year. So I'm really hoping we see the same, the same type uh, response. And we're going to rotate those through 12 locations in town as well. So looking forward to that. Is there anything further from my, my colleagues? Being none, thank you very much, Mr. Kemp and Ms. Spencer, for your presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Mr. Clerk, I understand Inspector Martin is ready to go. Through you, Mr. Mayor, Inspector Martin has rejoined the call. Okay, Inspector Martin, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Are you guys hearing me at all? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, uh, first of all, Mayor and Councillors, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be on board. Uh, this will be my first meeting with uh, Town of Ajax Council uh, in this format. I have uh, my staff sergeant, Mike Brown, present with me as well. Um, and I'm prepared to talk through sort of our monthly report year to date for crime trends, if that would be uh, acceptable for you. Please go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, this has been obviously an unusual year with COVID. Um, and uh, I guess generally our clientele or our main form of business uh, had a bit of a dormant period in March, April, May. Uh, obviously, it's increasing again. So our statistics are low, uh, or there's been a pretty consistent drop in all the trends uh, with some notable highlights that I'll talk about. Um, but I imagine that will rectify itself by year end, perhaps. We do see things lifting. Uh, but generally, we've broken things down into uh, different indicators. Uh, as far as violent offenses go for sexual assaults and robberies, uh, we're down 26 and 30 percent uh, year to date from 2019. Uh, property offenses are down uh, 32 percent. The anomaly there, of course, is break and enters to businesses are up 17 percent. So the number is up from 42 in 2019 to 49 in 2020. And that speaks a little bit to the business owners being absent. Uh, from their businesses during the closed periods uh, at the beginning of COVID. Um, but the offset with that, of course, is that residential break and enters are down 56% because people are home. So that decreases from 94 in 2019 to 41. Uh, we do have a spike uh, of theft of motor vehicles. Uh, right now, we are up 9% from last year, so 93 in 2019. To 101 currently in 2020. Um, and we are actually having our crime analyst in the detective office looking at that, at that actively. It's a spike of uh, surprisingly older vehicles in the range of eight to 15 years old that are being stolen. Um, and we're doing a bit of a, a look at you know, to see if it's actually related to probably people stealing them and scrapping them. Like we're talking like 2008 Camrays or uh, 2003 Honda Odysseys, uh, which are odd vehicles to steal. Uh, but that is a bit of a trend that we're working on. Uh, speaking to roadway safety, uh, motor vehicle collisions are down 32% and impaired are down 22%. Uh, now, just an odd comment tonight as I was coming to the station, they had a collision at Harwood and Hunt uh, around 6.30 p.m. And the gentleman driving the striking vehicle is in custody here right now doing a breath test. So that we have one extra collision in Ajax and another impaired driving charge as I speak. So that's still very active. Um, our call types have stayed relatively consistent. And our response time is relatively consistent throughout the year. Uh, we have had more shootings and discharge of firearms. It's up 36%, which sounds high, but that number, in fact, is four events increase. Uh, our detective branch and our uh, community response unit have been working actively on any of those investigations. And then to move over to uh, roadway safety. Uh, so uh, staff Brown was actually able to take a look at our stats uh, during the previous presentation. So the fatalities in Ajax so far this year are three. Um, and they occurred at Roslyn and Lake Ridge 
Westney and Williamson Drive and Church and Bailey. So that's where the three fatalities have occurred this year. It was just easier for us to like, take a look at our system. And there's been 15 fatalities in the region so far this year. So going across uh, collisions, uh, we are down 25% year to date from 2019, which I would suggest just simply speaks to that uh, calm period in, in April and May when there just wasn't a lot of vehicles on the road. Um, now, a nice anomaly, you'll be pleased to hear this, is our PONs issued, our traffic enforcement is actually up 9%. So at this point last year, we had issued 10,300 tickets. Uh, year to date, 2020 is 11,200. Uh, and that just speaks to me about the, uh, the strong work ethic of the members of this division. They're out uh, working away there all the time. Uh, impaired driving charges are down 12% year to date. And uh, as far as public safety and our compliance checks, uh, we're actually down 15%. But that is reflected, again, by not sending officers uh, into buildings and, and so on earlier on in the year uh, to check, or sorry, in, into April, May to check for offenders. But they're back to doing that. Um, now, just a couple things I wanted uh, Mike to talk about briefly uh, is a couple of operational things we've done specific to Ajax. And if I can turn it over to Mike for a moment. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, just uh, we've had some crime trends, like the inspector mentioned, about um, property issues and uh, lock it and lose it type initiatives where vehicles are broken into in southern Ajax down off of Pickering Beach Road. So this past Thursday, uh, numerous officers, auxiliary officers and investigators uh, flooded the area down that, that area. And they ended up canvassing and going to 30, 385 homes in the area, uh, presenting flyers and reminding uh, people in that area to uh, lock their vehicles and ensure that no personal belongings are left in there at night. Um, we tend to do these proactive initiatives to obviously educate the public, but also uh, show our uh, presence in the, the neighborhood. Um, obviously with COVID, um, we haven't been getting a lot of community engagement done. So this is one initiative that uh, we also need to keep addressing because crime trends are indicating that uh, these continue to go on. So that's one initiative we have going. As the inspector mentioned, <clears throat> our traffic initiatives continue to go on uh, even through COVID and we've handed out more tickets this year, year to date than we did last year. Um, in the last presentation, it was discussed about uh, some of the intersections, uh, high collision intersections within Pickering and Ajax, uh, obviously uh, more so with Ajax with this uh, council. But uh, I just wanna assure you that we continue to do these uh, proactive initiatives uh, quite often. Uh, normally they're around, we normally focus on the high 10 collision intersections in both Ajax and Pickering. And we do traffic blitzes that include um, left turn enforcement as well as um, um, handheld device enforcement. So we continue to do that uh, on an ongoing basis and uh, so far our results have been uh, fairly successful. Uh, a lot of these initiatives are mobile uh, handheld initiatives or we have uh, sometimes undercover officers out there monitoring the intersection looking for these devices. Um, no, that's uh, really what we had uh, for just sort of a brief overview of what's going on. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions for us if we open the floor up to that. You're muted. You're muted. Did it again, did it again. Uh, I've got three speakers on the list so far, starting with Councillor Crawford, then Lee and Khan. Thank you, Mr. Merrith. Um, through you, thank you for your report, Inspector Martin and Mike Brown. Uh, I uh, had a question around Durham Live. Uh, things are moving along quite aggressively in that area. I'm wondering, have you had any meetings with Durham Live, uh, um, spot talking about um, policing, I, I don't exactly know when they're planning to open. Speculation was January, but I'm not 100% sure if that's even going to happen. Um, could you just fill us in on anything that you can with those discussions? Uh, yeah, I, I've had one meeting uh, so far, and really it was a bit of a, it was a handover meeting uh, more than anything with Inspector Haskins and myself. Uh, so that initial meeting's been made. Mike's had a more current meeting, so I'll turn it over to him. He has a better idea about the opening plans. 
Yeah, last uh, Tuesday, we met over at the site, uh, walked through the casino. Uh, I've had a few tours there, but just got the most recent one. And they're fairly uh, well uh, along now. Uh, they, I believe the 15th floor of the hotel is up, so they'll start doing the internal construction. Um, their plan for a soft opening would be around April, is the speculation they have right now. Um, you know, obviously with COVID, I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. I think the, the doors um, in Ajax and as well as Blue Heron only allow 50 people inside at once now. So we don't anticipate the traffic issues that we originally thought when we started planning for um, traffic volumes that were going to come for the, the hard opening of the casino. So there's a lot up in the air right now. Uh, again, the casino is progressing well. They got a lot of uh, uh, machines and stuff in there ready to go. And it's quite impressive, the facility. But again, we're not anticipating the traffic issues that we originally thought. Well, that's good to know for our area, that's for sure. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, we had a report from the uh, the interim chief uh, this past month at Regional Council. And he was saying that, um, that the number of shooting incidences in Durham has gone has increased by 57% in 2020. Um, I don't know if you're able to answer that. What would that percentage be for Ajax uh, or, or is it more lumped in with Ajax Pickering? Are you able to give that information? Uh, I, I can give it, and it is linked in with Ajax Pickering. Uh, it take um, uh, obviously it's possible to do to dig in farther, but um, the shooting and discharges are up thirty percent, thirty six percent for Ajax Pickering, which numerically is four, which would arguably say we're working on top of thirty. I would suggest, sorry if my math's a little rusty on that, maybe in the area of 30 shootings for, uh, yeah, I think that's accurate math. But regardless, um, there's more. There's no two ways about that. Uh, it's, I, I mean, a lot of the firearms investigations going on with the intelligence branch uh, are showing significant increases. My last count is that officers from, from West Division, Ajax Pickering, have taken 17 handguns off the road through traffic stops and investigations, um, which is a stunning number, quite frankly. Uh, it just makes you, it, it, these are the ones our officers are picking up through enforcement. And, and the typical investigative uh, method is that officers are making traffic stops for, for noted traffic infractions, whether it's speeding or uh, danger or careless driving, whatever it might be. And then through observations, they're able to get legal authority to search the vehicle, whether it's uh, open liquor in the vehicle or cannabis. And through that detailed search, they're finding handguns, um, which makes me terribly uncomfortable. Um, and I think that's um, a bit of a, you know, it's sort of an overflow from Toronto is the, you know, obviously the amount of firearms and shooting in Toronto every year gets to be higher. And we'd be naive to think if that influence isn't coming out to the region. And I think we're starting to see more of that. Thank you. Thank you for your thank you for your presentation. That number is extremely disturbing, as you said. But uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Inspector Inspector, for your presentation. Uh, I'm kind of going to piggyback on Regional Councillor Crawford's questions. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we have a gangland. We have a gang task force specifically meant to look into gangs and shootings specifically. Are there any updates you can give us on that task force and its effectiveness so far in curbing, in curbing this kind of violent crime we're seeing in our community? It, that, so to answer that more specifically, probably Inspector Hudson from the uh, intelligence branch, uh, but we do have a, uh, a guns and gang enforcement unit. Uh, typically, they would focus on more region-wide uh, investigations that may bleed into Toronto or Peel or York. Uh, they just have that... Uh, operational agility to travel outside of the region. Uh, then internally, uh, we have our own uh, community response unit, which is a collection of uh, traffic enforcement, school enforcement, and uh, sort of a plain clothes unit that looks into drug complaints and gun complaints. Uh, they're efficient. They're, um, they're being successful in investigations. Um, I've been around a long time, and, and the problem is, I would suggest to you, is their level of efficiency is probably reflective of the volume of weapons that are out there. Uh, they're having luck at locating handguns because there's a lot out there. Uh, much like uh, my officers that are on patrol, 
uh, in doing these traffic stops are finding handguns, which again, as I said earlier, it disturbs me suggesting how many guns are out there. So yes, we're effective. Uh, yes, we are finding weapons uh, through gang investigations, drug investigations, and traffic stops. Do I think it's stopping the flow? Uh, I, I don't think it's stopping it. I think we're affecting it, but I think there's a lot of weapons out there right now. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, now, Inspector, we met um, in June during the BLM March in Ajax, and um, yes. was, I believe that was your first unofficial day. Um, so since then, the interim chief um, made a presentation to regional council talking about the DRPS plan of action on systemic racism, training and de-escalation. I'm just wondering, um, because your area of West Division is generally the most racialized, were there any kind of initiatives that you had outside of that DRPS plan of action to address uh, systemic racism? So um, it's, it, it's sort of, it's a, to me, it's a broader uh, plan right now. Uh, you, several years back, um, as our service started uh, a more diverse hiring practice, uh, one of the earlier decisions made was that the majority of diverse uh, officers of the service actually work out of this division, out of West Division. Um, and I love it because it represents the community we police. Uh, I would say most of the platoons are probably two-thirds diverse members. Um, and that changes you go across the region. This, this wasn't done by mistake. It was done by intention through uh, Chief Martin, and obviously it's being supported by Chief Rollauer as we move forward. So part of it, uh, part of the diversity training that we have in this division, in fact, is, is born with the members who work here. Uh, apart from that, uh, one of the things we're working on right now, uh, Staff Sergeant Yamada, who's working tonight, he's established a, uh, essentially a Sunday call-in. Uh, now, this is working through the F45 Fitness Club. They want to have a community sort of, gym event with the police and members of the gym. And the idea was to bring sort of uh, youth from the gym together with youth uh, or officers from the division and sort of find that common bond. Uh, they tried repeatedly to have the event and it just essentially couldn't happen because of COVID. Uh, so we decided to really do just a Zoom meeting, bring in members of the community who wanted to talk about uh, challenges, like what's it like to be a black police officer? What's it like to be a black female police officer? Why did this traffic stop happen? So on. It, it's, uh, it occurred on Sunday with uh, a great deal of success, and it's being moderated by our equity and inclusion unit or the headquarters. Uh, so we're doing a lot of internal stuff at the division. Uh, I'm blessed to have such a diverse division working in such a diverse community. Uh, other than that, we have our fairness and impartial policing training, uh, some diversity training, but we're not cutting edge yet. Uh, they're building more training into, into actually officer uh, training sessions. We're trying. Uh, we're not as good as I'd like to be, but I think I'm backed by a very diverse division. Um, that is incredibly uh, good to hear. It's, it's, I'm optimistic about you know, real change happening uh, specifically with the police and specifically with West Division. So I'm glad. Um, if you know, any way our council can be part participating, even just as ob observers, we love the invitation to these type of events. We can highlight it ourselves because um, it's the one thing I've been on since joining council, both regionally and locally, is the disparity between the representation on the force overall across Durham region, and more importantly, you know, in War II, where I do see um, a ton of crime, uh, both property and, you know, um, personal. Uh, you know, violence, and um, I, there has to be a change. And so I'm glad that you are proactively um, creating initiatives outside of the DRPS, um, the, the DRPS plan of action. So uh, anyway, we can help, please let us know, and please uh, continue, uh, please let your officers know that we appreciate all they've done during COVID. Thank you. Yeah, we certainly will, and thank you for the support. Um, so the Sunday, um, uh, talk session uh, that was sponsored by Staff Yamada. Uh, it was it was our first shot at it, um, and it went well. It is one of those things, you know, you, you don't want to praise something before at least it goes once. Uh, we updated command about that uh, this morning, actually, uh, and the suggestion is it should be a regional initiative. Uh, you know, it's one thing to have a great idea in West Division, but it should be shared across the entire region. Um, but they want to see how it's going here. 
and as we know, uh, the, you know, the dynamics and, and the, uh, you know, the socioeconomic uh, background or makeup of the region varies greatly with a region this large. Uh, and they might have slightly different uh, concerns in Cannington than they do in Ajax. But uh, I think we're off to a really good start by opening this forum up for you know members of the community uh, to ask us specific questions to actual officers about why things occur. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you Chair. Khan, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Inspector Martin, uh, the esteemed Mike Brown, thank you so much for coming out tonight and bringing the support to us. Um, I want to openly thank you for working so closely with me about traffic calming in, in Ward 2 around Williamson, along with uh, Constable Malcolm Wilson. Um, the last time Malcolm and I spoke, he was, uh, he was indicating that the, the police service will be equipped with a device that you can plug into the car's computers to find out if they were bypassing the catalyst converter and um, compromising the environmental act. Um, can you advise me if uh, the, you have been equipped with this, with this equipment already and how many officers have been, if, if it has been uh, executed, please? Absolutely, be my pleasure. So the uh, device, um, uh, I think it's called an OBD or an ODB reader. I apologize, it's one of the two. If there's any mechanics in the group, they would know the difference. Um, the device, uh, originally Malcolm Wilson had uh, attended the traffic unit to see about this new tool. And essentially mechanics use it uh, and plug it into your car to make a diagnostic check of your exhaust, exhaust system um, and all the parts therein. Uh, but it also can be used to find out if you circumvented any of these systems. So of course, if you and I go to a mechanic, they're finding a faulty O2 sensor in our legal cars. In this circumstance, they're checking cars that have illegal modifications. Um, Malcolm uh, was able to research it. We approved it, and it was actually approved to buy one for every traffic coordinator in the region. So now there's five of them out there, plus what the traffic unit has. Now, of interest um, for Pickering, not as much for Ajax, but uh, uh, Sunday, eight days ago, there was a unorganized car rally that was supposed to uh, show up at uh, uh, 1899 Brock Road, so at Brock and Pickering Parkway. Um, and they were essentially said they're going to take over that parking lot despite police presence. Uh, we sort of established a fairly aggressive program using uh, traffic officers, canine, uh, uniform patrol. And that particular device was used on three different cars that had done significant modifications to their cars. And when they hooked the device up, almost every piece of uh, safety and environmental equipment that was in that car had been stripped out of it, which allowed us to seize their license plates. And uh, they have to go to the ministry of the new safety to get their license plates back. So I believe it cost us a hundred and some dollars per unit. And that day we were able to take three cars off of the road uh, that had significant modifications and they were essentially unsafe. Uh, that same day, uh, they also got two cars for race driving. One was in Ajax and one was here in Pickering. And uh, that's the same night, if you recall, the 19 cars had shown up at the parking garage at, at the Pickering Go station and were racing around inside the garage. And Go Security contacted us and we just barricaded the garage and wrote 19 trespassing tickets for them. And it turns out of those 19, 10 were from out of region. They're from Peel. York, Toronto, uh, all over the place. And they're coming here to race. So we, uh, we're using that new piece of equipment we bought, uh, plus it really enhanced enforcement to <laughs> send the message out that quite frankly, they're not welcome out here. And if they come out here, we'll try to take your car. So it's uh, been a success so far, sir. Thank you very much. I wanted to hear that. And I wanted my colleagues to also hear that. And uh, we will try our best to get that message out as well. Uh, thank you, Inspector. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You're on mute, Mayor. Not a mechanic, but I believe it's an OBD reader. I'll, I'll go with that. Sounds right. <laughs> I don't have anybody else on my speaking list. Uh, Councilor Bauer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Inspector Martin and Staff Sergeant Brown. Uh, very interesting reports and statistics. I did have a couple questions. Uh, one was regarding the um, 
the Sunday call-in uh, program that you are organizing. And how are you guys, how is that being uh, publicized or advertised in the community if people want to join that? Is there a plan? Uh, there will be a plan. I, I, it's a word of mouth right now, which I'm sure makes you cringe. But uh, we really just wanted to get a feel for it to see what it was like. Uh, and one of the, you know, one of my concerns, uh, you know, as I said to the, as I said to Staff Yamada's first name is Kevin. As I said to Kevin, I said, I don't want to start developing this and growing it. And then suddenly I don't have officers available to be in front of the camera. Um, you know, if we're in, we're in. Uh, so we just wanted to try the first one and also the appropriateness of the questions. Uh, if it just turns into a situation where, you know, members of the public just want to tell us that they dislike us, they think we're bad or we don't do our job properly, it has really zero gain. Uh, but after the first one, it went well. Uh, we will probably open this up a bit more um, and I'll probably rely on the equity and inclusion unit to do that. After all, it is their sort of uh, mandate. Uh, it, now, staff Yamada found this opportunity and, and grew it, but it'll probably get handed over to equity and inclusion to manage it in the future, which would then open it up to all the different community groups that equity and inclusion is involved in, and they can start coordinating different people to be involved in the question and answers. That's great. Thank you very much. Yes, you're right. I think the more we can communicate that, the better. Um, and also about... Um, I had a question, is there staff who monitor uh, social media groups in the community? Um, I know that, for example, when you mentioned the Pickering Beach uh, break-in area, that was, there's some uh, South Ajax neighborhood Facebook groups that are very active and keep each other informed of what's going on. So I know that would have been part of that whole awareness program as well as what the RPS was doing. And currently, it's all about uh, they've got the same type of uh, car break-ins and I believe um, it's escalating a little bit over in the Exeter Road area, close to town hall neighborhoods. So I'm just wondering, is there, um, is there someone who monitors the community groups to see that kind of news and information? Uh, no, not in particular. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, monitoring those sort of community groups is like, keeping out your eye on a spot in the ocean. You may not be looking in the right place. Um, so we do what we can uh, to monitor them. Mostly, obviously, we count on our own data gathering. So we have a crime analyst who uh, researches uh, all the calls for service to give me these stats I just provided with you. And the issue, of course, is that people don't report it. So, you know, if 15 people have their cars broken into an extra and one person calls the police, we know of one entry. Uh, now, the next problem is if we count on social media to drive where we do things, there's also, uh, as we all know, can be some incredible inaccuracy in social media. Uh, so generally what happens is we'll get a tip from somebody, uh, sometimes an employee, uh, or but members, and often they'll reach out to council and say, hey, this is going on, you message it to us. That often is how we start looking at social media. It's just... It's too vast. I, I don't have enough people to even begin to monitor it. Um, but that being said, sometimes the information that comes out of it is also inaccurate. So we're counting on our, you know, our, our record system and people who report things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's it for me. Thank you. That exhausts my speakers list. Anybody else? No. Um, I forgot my question, so we'll we'll just wrap this up. Thank you very much for for the. Uh, oh, I remember what it was. With the on, I thought I was off the hook. <laughs> you, we put you after the uh, Vision Zero, so I'm sure you heard the conversation about the automatic speed enforcement. Yes. And the reduction of thirty percent, pretty impressive numbers. Um, so that's coming soon, and and obviously we want to embrace technology and, and sort of free up police to be out doing more serious matters and catching speeders. So that's coming soon and we'll be uh, looking forward to that. But I'm very glad to hear what Councillor Khan brought up about you cracking down on these very loud modified vehicles. It's becoming more and more of an issue and I'm getting more and more calls about that. And um, it didn't seem like anything was happening. So I'm very glad to hear that you have the tools to address that. 
and that you are being proactive about that. So please uh, keep driving that one forward. That one's going to really have a good impact on our uh, county. Yes, sir. Yeah, for certainly. We, we appreciate your support on that. It's, uh, you know, sort of the comment about uh, some of the more serious car collisions that have occurred during COVID, clear, clearly the <laughs> number of crashes should have dropped, but they didn't. And that is related to people speeding around. Now, it's not always a modified car. You can be racing around in a, just a stock Honda Civic and go very fast. But uh, these people are focused on designing fast cars with very little safety. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're very much worth our time and attention. And very little common sense a lot of the time, too. Unfortunately, you're correct, yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we really appreciate you coming out and giving us that update and enjoy the rest of your evening. That's our pleasure. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Moving on, uh, Mr. Clerk, is uh, Mr. Norris here from DRT? Yes, Mr. Norris is here. Okay, uh, Mr. Norris, Deputy General Manager Operations, Durham Regional Transit, uh, to give us an update on the, um, the service redesign and system enhancements. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Norris. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Your Worship, elected members of council and members of the public. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. Uh, today, I'll be presenting DRT service redesign and transit system enhancements. Uh, so this will include a bit of an overview of what our current ridership is like, ridership recovery strategy, the launch of phase A of the service plan and specifics to the town of Ajax, and an overview of DRT's new customer applications and services. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, to reflect changing demand due to COVID-19, DRT adjusted its service on March 23rd and again on June 8th. Uh, ridership currently sits at 36% of 2019 levels. Uh, the graph before you illustrates how the travel patterns have changed. Gone are the typical weekday morning and afternoon peak periods. There's also been a significant reduction in customers connecting to Go Transit train and bus services, and much lower travel to Durham College, Ontario Tech University, and Trent University. These two markets represent approximately half of the normal daily boardings on DRT services. DRT expects the current travel patterns to continue in the foreseeable future. Uh, we're currently holding bi-weekly conversations with post-secondary institutions and maintaining contact with the Durham Student Transportation Services and peers at Metrolinx, TTC, YRT, and Brampton Transit. Next slide, please. The ridership recovery strategy is made up of several initiatives to increase ridership to pre-COVID levels. So these are a multi-phase service plan that launches services st strategically to align with customer demand, investigating and launching transit priority infrastructure such as bus lanes to decrease transit travel times, and doing market survey on customers' anticipated future travel habits as we exit the pandemic. So this evening, I'll be providing you with an overview of the first phase of the service plan that was launched on September 28th. So it builds on uh, service match to demand, ensuring access to transit to all residents, 15 minute or better service on busy corridors and on-demand transit where demand is low. We also have a number of new customer tools to make it easier to travel. So a uh, new trip planning platform and real-time trip information, the new on-demand platform that enables uh, spontaneous trip making and the new Presto contactless e-ticketing platform. So next slide, please. The also on September 28th, we DRT launched its phase A of its service plan. The frequent grid and grid network operates every 30 minutes or better and carries 90% of uh, that pre-September 20th uh, ridership. So these routes are accessible to 80% of homes within a 10 walk, minute walking distance in the region. Our new on-demand service uh, is now available in areas where ridership is lowest, including new residential commercial areas and those where routes had been uh, canceled uh, back in June. A new uh, framework has been developed to monitor demand throughout the transit network. So this will ensure that sufficient capacity is deployed on busy routes and that bus routes are launched where ridership increases uh, meets thresholds. Next slide, please. 
uh, before you right now is a simplified map of the new phase A transit network. Uh, the new network provides uh, access to transit service throughout the region. So uh, before you, the thick orange lines represent that frequent network where it operates 15 minutes or better Monday to Friday until 7 p.m. and 30 minutes or better at all other times. The thinner orange lines operate every 30 minutes or better at all times. And the orange uh, shaded zones before you are the on-demand service that's available all day, seven days per week. Uh, next slide, please. So what is this uh, on-demand? So uh, on-demand is a service delivery model that's permitted DRT to maintain and expand access to transit services while managing fiscal challenges brought on by COVID-19. Uh, DRT has also expanded its reach in new, in new residential areas and business areas prior to minimum density targets being met. So we can establish transit habits from the beginning and avoid families having to purchase a, a, another car. So our on-demand network operates as an extension of bus routes, so you can book trips as close to 15 minutes before your trip. Uh, regular DRT fares apply and a DRT uh, ProMaster or a contracted service sedan or van uh, will provide you the ride. Um, you can travel within a zone or connect to a bus route or uh, uh, connect to your local GO train station. Uh, it operates uh, Monday to Friday, 5 a.m. to midnight, Saturday, 7 a.m. to midnight, and Sunday, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. You can book using the new app, uh, or you can always call a uh, booking agent at uh, one 247 and they'll um, uh, help you book that. And they're open uh, on, during those hours of service that I mentioned. So if I could ask you to uh, go to uh, slide eight, uh, phase eight, town of Ajax, please. Thank you. So within the town of Ajax, ridership uh, was at 25% uh, of uh, 2019 levels. Um, you'll see that there's a number of on-demand services uh, uh, that, um, uh, that are now uh, available within the town from early morning to late night and a number of, uh, of those grid and uh, frequent transit network services that are also available. So residents can easily travel to a destination within the town or throughout the region and continue to connect to either Go Transit, uh, the TTC um, at, at Ajax station. So I could ask you to turn to page 12, transit mobility in rural areas. Thank you. Um, Transit's also expanded uh, its coverage to encompass all of Durham's uh, region's rural areas um, uh, throughout all eight uh, local area municipalities. So it uses the same on-demand platform to provide flexibility in trip making to connect throughout the region. Next slide, please. So I'll be walking you through uh, some of our new trip planning on demand and e-ticketing applications. Next slide, please. So DRT and its partners have launched new tools for customers to plan, book and pay on transit. So to your left um, is the uh, trip planning application uh, transit. Um, you book, uh, if you need require, your trip requires an on-demand booking, you can do that through DRT on demand. And we now offer, uh, an e-ticketing solution uh, through uh, Presto e-tickets, um, uh, which is available uh, both on Android and Apple platforms. Uh, Transit is probably the, the benchmark that's out there for trip planning and navigation. Um, you can plan your trip throughout the GTHA and it's available, uh, it encompasses 200 plus cities worldwide. So you can uh, access schedule in real time information uh, throughout and um, depending on where you're at, it also encompasses multimodal trips with uh, uh, through bike share, TNC, so Uber, Lyft, and car sharing where that's available. So, what's unique to DRT is that we have this integrated trip planning with on demand. Um, so you get that complete uh, multimodal trip through there. Um, since launching on September 28th, uh, our on demand services carried 4,000 trips uh, throughout. Uh, uh, Durham, and 55 to 60% of those trips are, are booking the, the new application right now. Uh, the e-tickets 
uh, we expect to have future integration into transit. Uh, uh, so it'll be a one-stop shop there. Um, so what that permits a uh, customer to do is buy their, uh, their tickets, load them on their, um, uh, through an application on their smartphone and uh, can simply show their e-ticket to the operator uh, for visual uh, verification. Next slide, please. So just a, a, just a quick overview of, uh, of a trip planning scenario. So um, uh, that you can use, uh, that in includes our new on-demand service. So um, with that trip planning application that you see on your, uh, on your left of the screen there, you can uh, enter your origin and your intended destination. You can choose to leave now at a future time, or you can uh, enter in a, uh, a desired arrival time at your destination as well. So it'll provide you um, with a number of uh, trip options, including the one here at the bottom of your screen, that Transit Plus, where um, you see the on-demand uh, trip uh, uh, show up. So you can select that, push that, and what pops up and uh, on your screen after is a trip map and details. So you, you'll be able to situate yourself geographically and also give you um, uh, walk through uh, directions uh, essentially on what your trip is. And you can uh, request your, uh, push that request uh, DRT on demand button and it'll um, move you to your DRT on demand uh, application to, uh, uh, to confirm that. Next slide, please. So um, as part of the uh, improvements to access to contactless fair payment options as part of uh, um, uh, our, our new reality that we operated, uh, operate in. Uh, DRT's made available uh, Presto cards, but also Presto e-tickets. So both provide convenient contactless fare payments for customers traveling on DRT. Uh, the e-ticketing solution provides all of our regular DRT fares through a simple application that can be activated anywhere. So you don't, once those are loaded on, you don't need a, um, uh, a data plan uh, to be able to activate them uh, since they're stored locally on on the on the device. Um, we we still have a fair uh, incentive program, so the, the uh, you've targeted Y10 program and our uh, transit assistant programs that uh, continue to use our, our Presto cards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, obviously, informing customers and residents of upcoming service changes is always key at DRT. Um, supported by the region's communication, a corporate communications office, a uh, full complement of tactics were used to create awareness of the changes uh, that happened on September 28th and as we uh, roll out uh, new services as well. Um, to, in addition to stop level and bus advisories, local print, radio, and TV partners were leveraged to reach Durham residents. Uh, there was a targeted social media messaging campaign that included paid advertising and provided the opportunity to engage uh, with residents and create awareness. Um, a number of new digital packages were shared with the local area municipalities to increase that reach as well. Um, in addition to those communications to date, there's ongoing communications throughout this fall uh, to keep residents and customers informed of uh, the services that are available, but also um, some of the upcoming uh, uh, changes if, there, if we were to convert uh, or launch new scheduled services as well. Uh, so this concludes my presentation today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Norris, for the excellent presentation. I have three Councillors on the speaking list so far, starting with Councillor Tyler Morris. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Norris, for your presentation. Um, can you expand a little bit uh, on seniors um, riding in the system? Has that number pretty much stayed? Uh, can you speak to the numbers? Have, have they moved um, a little bit more than what you had mentioned? Um, I do not have uh, demographic uh, information with me. Um, okay. The, um, I want to provide you a bit of context. Uh, the it, All of our markets uh, decrease, some more than others. We do know that uh, seniors continue to travel with us as they access shopping, 
activity community centers and whatnot um, and we continue to support them in their travels but uh, i do i'll have to come back okay. to you on exactly no, that, numbers that's good to hear because that's a, that's a sector of our of, you know of our community that you know sometimes it's not an option you know they're living alone or, and, and i'm glad to hear that that's the drt still being able to accommodate that's really what the uh, you know the gist of my question was secondly students going to um durham regional or sorry durham college and ontario tech university i believe in 2019 as part of their tuition fees they were included a, a bus pass but now with and, and you can correct me if that's wrong so you know the idea that it was free is not really free it's part of the however many uh, how much money this you know they're, they're spending on their education they would get a bus pass for that i believe so with them not taking the bus anymore has durham college stopped buying those bus passes for students because so many of them are online now every kid you talk to is, is taking courses online uh, I, had the resident, I had a resident ask me about that because they said this time anyways go ahead sorry uh, nope uh, that excellent question um uh, uh, DRT and uh, uh, Durham College, Ontario Tech University, and Trent University, uh, uh, those administrations and DRT had a universal pass program uh, that was uh, operated there. So uh, as part of ancillary fees uh, for each of those, um, uh, it was a mandatory ancillary fee that uh, each of the students at those participating uh, uh, institutions uh, would purchase that program right now is uh, is suspended at the request of the those institutions. Um, so uh, it is yeah it's temporarily suspended. At okay, this time. that that kind of explains uh, the, the uh, qu my question. Thank you so much. Yep. No, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is on the on-demand. The on-demand service is for stops that you currently do not make regular stops at now. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, um, yes, as, uh, but zones are identified where um, the on-demand service is available. Um, so uh, through the application, it, it will tell you if... Um, uh, you're able to travel or, or not to, to and from uh, your location. It'll identify the zone for you. So it's not at all locations then? No, um, there are stops that uh, currently are, are deactivated um, and it all depends on where a customer uh, is with respect to the scheduled bus service that, that is out there. Okay. Um... Yeah, I, I found it a little bit confusing. I was trying to uh, to read up on it before tonight, but I, I found it just a little bit confusing. Uh, I did download the app, so hopefully I'll be able to use it in the future. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Um, I also downloaded the app and I have a few questions. Um, is my Presto Express not linked to my Presto? Is that a separate account? Um, through the chair, Presto, your Presto card? Uh, Presto, the, the login I use for Presto is different than the Presto e-tickets. Is that, am I correct there? I, that is correct. It would be two separate systems is my understanding. You can see why the layman, i.e. me, could make that mistake, right? When I see Presto, I assume it'd be like the same login for both. So I, I just, we should definitely make that clear for our subscribers. Um, my question I'll make also, the I'll pass yeah. the comment on to Presto. Please do. And also, um, so the book, the the spare app, is that available on Android as well? Did I miss that it was iOS only? Uh, no, it is both available on Android and um, and Apple, uh, and it's uh, DRT on demand. So it's the name of the app is DRT on demand, not That's correct. spare. DRT Correct. on demand. Great. Um, I mean, listen, I mean, I've been to Hong Kong where they have the octopus and the octopus is like the most like integrated network between the app and, you know, the card and whatnot. So um, 
you know, obviously that's where we aspire to be. And obviously we're a lot smaller than Hong Kong. I get that. I just think, you know, we use the phrase integrated customer experience, yet we have three distinctly different apps that aren't even run by the same people. Like I would love to see ultimately a single app for everything I need for transit. I think that should be the, the goal. Um, but I, I understand there's costs involved with that. But I just think in order for us to truly realize a transit system that people are gonna use all the time and go to these specific nodes, they, they shouldn't have to open three different apps to get to that point. But obviously from where we were before to where we are now, it's huge progress and I'm not blind to that. So that's just my feedback of, you know, imagine you are a senior who's not very tech savvy, having to link through up to three different apps to get to A to B would be problematic. Um, so, you know, part of the reason Uber is successful is it's easy to use and it's very easy to navigate. And obviously I'm not, I don't really support ride shares. I think they're very, the gig economy is very detrimental to municipalities, but they did get that part right. So my only feedback is, you know, I'd love to see a, a truly integrated system that would only have one app that gives the consumer everything they need from that one app. Um, through the chair, no, thank you. That's great feedback. Uh, I know that is our, our intention and we're working with those partners uh, to, to move towards that. It's uh, uh, getting all those partners coordinated uh, is, uh, is uh, probably the biggest challenge that we're having, but thank you. Thank you. And thankfully we know, I, I, I know personally the chair of the DRT, so I'm sure I can uh, put a few <laughs> words in his ear. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before I move on to Councillor Bauer, just the the e-ticketing is a made in Durham solution. Um, you know, there's a lot of shortfalls with Presto. Uh, I don't know, Tim Hortons can figure it out how to load their cards, but Presto, you know, still has some challenges. So this, I was actually quite proud of this. We had an Ontario Big City Mayor's meeting last Friday and um, Minister Bethlehem Falby was there and part of his portfolio is technology. And he was asking about some of the technology and what we've been doing with regards to COVID. And I quite proudly told him about the e-ticketing and our on-demand app and those things that we had done in Durham uh, with DRT, because I'm not aware that other municipalities have, have been that proactive. But I do agree, we would all like to see one app and one system. We, we still have that that boundary to try and uh, cross borders, for instance, you know, we still have trouble handoffing between DRT and uh, TTC, for instance, and and that's something we've got to overcome as well before we can get one seamless system. But I think we're making good progress. Anyway, Councillor Bauer, you are next. Thank you, Chair. And yes, I agree with you that that uh, DRT is making great progress. Thank you, Mr. Norris, for your presentation. I do have some questions. I did not download the app, so forgive me if, if I had and the answer would be clear to me. Um, your slide about the multi-phase service plan, it says 80% of dwellings are within a 10 minute walk or 800 meters to a frequent network, network or grid route. Does that mean bus stop? Uh, that is correct. Okay, and then it also says the third bullet is 10% of current ridership in on-demand zones. So I'm not, I don't, I don't understand what that means. Are those, those shaded areas on the map of on-demand zones are not within 10 minutes to a bus stop? Uh, uh, through the chair, uh, that's a, a great question. And then uh, the, uh, the material may, may be a little older. So uh, prior to our move into the, the launch into phase A, 90% um, of, uh, of the ridership on a daily basis uh, was on uh, those fr that frequent and grid network that, that you saw on, on, on slide five. Um, we estimated at that time that about 10% of our ridership um, would be uh, move, would be located in within those on-demand zones at that time. Um, once that network was launched, um, uh, funny enough, our uh, during that first week of transition, our our ridership went up actually six percent compared to the week prior. Uh, we were carrying more people on that that grid network, and our 
um, our on-demand services is slowly growing as well at the same time. So that that's where that 90 and 10% uh, numbers come from. Okay, thank you. Um, so for on-demand, as you can book trips, the day of travel as close as 15 minutes before by app or phone. So if I wanted to book a trip, um, you would pick me up, I'm in the on-demand zone and I would get picked up at a stop in within that zone and it would take me where I was wanted to go. Would it also pick up other riders along the route or is this a private um, ride for the person who orders it? Uh, through the chair, that's an excellent question. We do pool uh, customers. So if there are customers um, uh, where it does make sense that along the trip, we can pick them up and drop them off to, during the trip or after you have uh, completed yours, that would uh, the software behind uh, that uh, uh, would uh, uh, would accept that 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 trip request and 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 pool those customers together. And I'm guessing then everybody would be required to wear a mask, and there would be all the measures for uh, you know uh, COVID restrictions in place for, during during the use of these cars. That's just a comment, not a question. But if I wanted to, let's say I, I want every Tuesday at four, I want a ride to go to the mall. Do I need to book that every Tuesday at four or can I book a recurring event? Uh, through the chair, uh, at this time, we do uh, a day of bookings. That is something that uh, uh, we're looking into how we would manage the subscription bookings in, uh, so that um, uh, people are reminded that if they are going to be doing a recurring trip over and over, that they don't forget that they've actually uh, done that. So we're working, uh, we are looking into that with our software provider on how the mechanics of that would look like. Okay, great. I think that would be a handy tool. Just following up with the comment earlier regarding um, the, the seniors use of bus um, services. I think that would be a handy tool for, for seniors and for everyone and especially that age group. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. That exhausts my speakers list. Is there anyone else? Hearing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Norris. Appreciate the presentation and keep up the good work. Thank you. Have a great evening and thank you again for having me. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. That concludes our delegations and presentations. <clears throat> Moving on to items of correspondence. We have moved by Councillor Dye, seconded by Councillor Lee, that the report dated October 19, 2020, containing items of correspondence be adopted. Do we have any polls in the correspondence for discussion? I think Councillor Khan, you just wanted to speak to one of the proclamations. Yes, Your Worship, if I may. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, October is Islamic History Month in Canada. And I just wanna share uh, a few little notes about about Muslims in Canada. And some of the things might surprise you, like the names of the first Muslims in Canada. The first recorded Muslims in Canada in Canadian history were James and Agnes Love, a young Muslim couple from their native Scotland before they migrated to Canada in 1854, settling in Ontario. Their youngest son, Alexander, was born in 1868, one year after Confederation, and secured his spot in history as the first recorded Muslim born in Canada. There's about one and a half million Muslims that lives in Canada and 44% of Canadian Muslims have a university degree compared to 26% of the Canadian population in general. 1.3% of the Muslim Canadian population have a doctorate degree. Muslims are 1.8 billion or about 24% of the world's population and the mosque is not only a place of worship, but also partners with local food banks and other community services. Canadian Muslims continue to serve in law enforcement, healthcare, politics, and entertainment. The Canadian Muslim community is rich and multifaceted, deeply ingrained into the fabric of the broader Canadian community, political life, industry, and business. Mr. Mayor, on behalf of all Muslims, I thank Ajax for allowing us this honor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Khan. And that, of course, is in regards to October being Islamic History Month. 
Uh, and yes, we do have a very large um, Muslim community here in Ajax, and I've been uh, able to come and enjoy a lot of things up there at the uh, Majid, and it's been uh, always a great experience. So thank you for pointing those things out. Anything further on any of the items of correspondence? Hearing none, those in favor of receiving, thank you. That's carried. Moving on to the reports, we have moved by Councillor Khan, second by Councillor Tyler Morin, the, the Community Affairs and Planning Committee report dated October 5th, 2020, be adopted. And that's to do with the Carruthers March Pavilion, I believe, and our comments. Any questions or comments on the uh, Community Affairs and Planning report? Hearing none, those in favor? Any opposed? No, nope, that's carried. Moving on to the General Government Committee report, moved by Councilor Bauer, second by Councilor Crawford, that the General Government Committee report dated October 13th, 2020 be adopted. Questions or comments on the GGC meeting? That was a rather packed meeting where we had our new boulevard encroachment policy. Um, we uh, froze the user fees and of course, change in the name of the Graph Spay were three of the highlight items on that. Any questions or concerns? Seeing none, those in favor? I saw all hands, none opposed, that's carried. And summary of advisory committee reports, moved by Councillor Lee, second by Councillor Bauer, that the summary of advisory committee activities dated October 19, 2020, as attached to the meeting agenda be received for information and the recommendations contained therein be referred to staff where applicable. Questions or comments on the advisory committee reports? Hearing none, those in favor of receipt? Any opposed? No, that's carried. Moving on to departmental reports, we have uh, Mr. Romanowski, traffic calming along Williamson Drive, West Petition, and Mr. Grieve. And I believe there's, is there a presentation on this, Mr. Clerk? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there's no presentation with this report. Okay. So we have the traffic calming along Williamson Drive West petition moved by Councillor Bauer, second by Councillor Dyes, that the report entitled traffic calming along Williamson Drive West petition be received for information. Questions or comments? Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Grieve and Romanowski, for uh, setting up this report. This was, um, Councillor Connor and I have been receiving a lot of feedback on this the past year, so um, it's good to get the data. I just wanted to make sure um, the accident that had happened on West Neen Williamson, which is right by that area, that was factored into the, um, was, was that factored into the, um, the data collected? Mr. Grieve, are you on the call? Yes, I am. So through the mayor to, to regional councilor Lee, uh, the, this section or the response to this petition is specifically for the Ravenscroft to Bellinger ah, section right. of Williamson. Um, and so uh, the, the accident that occurred at Westney and Williamson it would not be appropriate to, to look at it in, in this case. And generally that's, that's like a, I guess like, um, you know, in serious accidents that are uh, close to uh, areas that are being examined, those those are never really factored in as, uh, even though like it's a proximity of like, probably like 30, 40 meters, correct? Uh, through the mayor to regional council, proximity to this location, to, right. to this segment would be a couple hundred meters to the intersection of, oh, okay. of Williamson and, and Westy. It would be 300 and something, I believe, if I remember. Yeah, I don't have a distance. concept of distance watching off of Google Map, to be honest. So yeah, I'll, I'll take your <laughs> I'll take your numbers over mine. Um, okay, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, we, we kind of, I, I think I speak, I fairly speak for Councillor Khan and I when I say that we still feel that traffic calming is required along Williamson this stretch. Um, you know, we, you, you get those feedbacks from our residents and it's something we are taking seriously. Um, but for now, no action on our part, or on my part at least. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Grief, thank you for your hard work on this. Um, 
So I'm aware of this part. This is the Western part of uh, Williamson between Ravenscroft and Bellinger. And um, can you advise please when this study was taken, the, the most recent study, the period it was done? So through the mayor to, to Councilor Khan, the as noted in the in the report, the data was collected both in 2018 and 2019. 2000 and 2019. Thank you. Now um, you would know that there is a, a, a school being built there right now in that exact area, correct? And um, uh, I know there's gonna be a lot of increased traffic and a lot of um, risks involved. So um, I understand, and this this area was very well built because there's an always pop sign right at Tozier, like smack in the middle of that stretch, which would which would um, you know navigate the traffic and the speeding a lot. So no, I really appreciate what you did, but I would really be concerned and and be cognizant that we might need to do this again after that school has reopened. So I just wanted to bring that, um, I, and I drive through there a lot, just keeping an eye on the area and see what's going on. But the, that school's almost done, and then we know the traffic is going to increase. And we're talking here, right, like uh, with Councilor Lee and I were talking, this is the, the western part of, of uh, Williamson. We still have to deal with the, the, the eastern part towards west. But uh, this part here, um, yeah, it, it, it will have to be relooked at when that school is complete, because it's going to be a whole different traffic schedule we're going to be looking at. But I, I must, uh, I do appreciate all the work you, you guys have been doing and, uh, and thank you for this report. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member or council wish to speak to this report? I'll just follow up quickly to Councillor Khan's comments. Um, given this location, Mr. Grieve, is it, will there be an opportunity to look at potentially creating a community safety zone at a later date? Uh, to, to respond to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, as um, outlined when we presented the community safety zone uh, checklist or, or review list uh, in, in February of this year, uh, absolutely. There's there's a set of criteria we can, uh, can uh, review a location on and, and should this location uh, meet that, that criteria, we would, we would absolutely look at creating a, a community safety zone in this area. Okay, and given that, we would be able to cycle our automatic speed enforcement through this community safety zone if created to help uh, slow people down if needed. That is correct. Yeah, should it be should it be de deemed a community safety zone, it would be eligible for automated speed enforcement. Okay, thank you very much. That's my questions. Anything further? Hearing none. Uh, those in favor of receiving the report. Any opposed? None opposed. That's carried. Thank you. Moving on to our next departmental report, safe restart funding phase two application moved by Councillor Crawford, second by Councillor Khan, that council directs staff to apply for the second phase of federal provincial safe restart funding by the October 30th, 2020 deadline. Questions or comments on this report? No, as stated, uh, Councillor Lee, go ahead. Uh, just very quickly, um, to me, um, so this is phase two. Uh, there'll be subsequent phase. Like this only goes up to September, if I'm not, if I read the report correctly. Uh, is Miss Cruciano on the call right now, or does this go to yeah? Miss Cruciano, or you I can answer the question there, um, Chair, through the Chair to Regional Councilor Lee. Um, I believe there's only two phases to this funding. Um, what the um, the funding requires that uh, staff provide an estimate up to the end of the year. So they look at September 30th actual numbers and then a forecast to the end of the year. Got it. Um, and um, the, the, the balance uh, that we, the, the deficit that we have will be kind of addressed in our future budget meeting uh, coming over the next few months, correct? Ms. Valentin? My apologies. I think my headphones gone out. I didn't hear anything Councillor Lee said. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. I was just saying. Um, so the the balance. I think it was about four million outstanding. Uh, after the after, should we get uh, approval for this safe research funding, that will then be addressed in uh, the future budget uh, process over the next few months. Correct. Uh, yes, we will. We will look at that as well. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. 
for the chair, if I can just add quickly um, some this funding in particular um, is intended by the provincial and federal governments to address the 2020 um, pressures, as uh, Director Valentin mentioned. Um, however, there have been conversations through, um, for example, on the OBCM meetings that the mayor sits on and, and other hints that have been provided by the province um, that they understand that these financial pressures that will be, that are faced by municipalities um, will extend through 2021 um, and that municipalities overall do have other um, challenges. Uh, so while the details of what those funds would be or, or what those look like have not been released, um, staff expect that there will be future opportunities to recoup some funds above and beyond this particular um, allotment of funding. Okay, that is very good to know, obviously, because um... Yes, I mean, we're obviously still in the thick of things, so, so to speak, um, and um, with uh, no dis uh, discernible end in sight. So I just want to make sure that the our respective uh, higher governments understand that, and it looks like they do. So that is very uh, good to know. Thank you uh, for your comments. That's something just to add before anybody else um, jumps in, that at the, what was LUMCO, which is now Ontario Big City Mayors, we have regular meetings with the ministers at these events and uh, we do not ever miss an opportunity to remind them of how important this is and uh, how we're not able to run deficits and how we need assistance from the federal provincial government. So that message goes through every opportunity that we, that we have. Anybody else wish to speak to this report? Okay, seeing none, those in favor? I see all hands, that's carried, thank you. Moving on to regional council's reports. Are there any regional council reports? Councilor Dives. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to briefly discuss one of the initiatives that um, social services at the region are handling at the moment. Uh, as, as you know, I think all of us have seen an increase uh, in homelessness around our community. Uh, we have for quite some time been working here in Ajax with the Homelessness Task, Task Force for two years. And over the COVID issue, it uh, became very apparent that it was difficult for people without homes to look after themselves and look after others during COVID. So um, Camp Samac was set up and um, homelessness hubs were set up in several municipalities. Camp Samac was set up for um, people who, who could go up there and stay there throughout the COVID um, <coughs> first phase. And it worked very, very well. So we became very good at connecting services to ensure that these things um, worked and supported what those um, uh, residents needed. So because of that came the idea of one we've known before micro homes as the homelessness task force had visited a micro home, which was basically um, part of a train car that they can make into a house. And um, these modular homes or micro homes are very are cost effective. You don't have to dig into the ground. They can put on a concrete pad. Um, so the process of actually developing or finding or placing them on land is a lot more affordable. So the province, or sorry, the region is looking at a 50 modular home design up in Beaverton on the main street on a piece of land that the region owns. Um, all of the service that they will need uh, through the community, through not-for-profit organizations or, or whatever will be, uh, will have the ability to come to that uh, location sort of like what they call hoteling suites, the office suites where they come to that location and offer the services as needed and with the intention to get them back on their feet and uh, into, their, into a permanent home and hopefully into employment. Uh, most of, uh, you know, many of the people are, it's just uh, bad timing. As one gentleman said, he had an operation by the time he had recovered and COVID had kicked in and the job was no longer available and he lost his apartment. So there's uh, real hope for this. They will be, the region will be ha hosting a public open house for residents in Beaverton and businesses in Beaverton to get some full details of, of the, um, 
the development and that'll be on their website if you need any further information and also where to call if you have any further questions but it's uh it's a it's a great it's great progress in that we had um, at, at the region, we had identified the problem of homelessness and to eradicate it and provide more homes. Um, at, you know, I think it was within the next five years. So we're doing very well, we're getting there. So it's a good news story. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Crawford. Uh, thank you, I'm off, okay. I uh, just wanted to, uh, works was fairly light uh, this particular uh, month. Uh, but I did want to mention that at uh, Regional Council, we did have a presentation from the interim uh, deputy chief, which was very interesting, and also had the presentation come back for uh, what uh, body worn cameras um, that we had requested through a motion. Uh, I think it was back in August or something like that. So the information uh, we have, uh, it was it was very good information. Um, and I was just happy to see that, uh, that both of these reports happen to come back on the same time. Uh, I think Councillor Lee is going to take cow. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Lee. <laughs> actually, um, I was actually going to just piggyback onto what um, Regional Councillor Crawford was talking about uh, in that we had interim uh, Chief Rowler, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, do a report. Um, there was a bit of a focus on um, systemic racism, which I had brought up with Inspector Martin, and just uh, some of the things, some of the actionable steps that DRPS is taking uh, to address um, systemic racism um, within the force, which includes um, an internal audit of their uh, racialized members to kind of get a demographic look to see truly how representative we are. I believe the numbers were you know, 24% of Durham region is racialized right now, whereas our force is ballpark 9%, which is obviously not what we want to see um, in spite of all the good things happening in West Division. And the um, there's a community, an engagement of community leaders uh, that's going to be happening with the GRPS through their inclusion unit as well. And um, the, we also received an open invitation for um, to uh, talk about training and de-escalation. Um, this is a big point for me because uh, a few months ago when I had spoken to at the time chief, um, the chief, he was saying how that information was generally not going to be provided. So at least there's an opening from DRPS to talk about uh, training and de-escalation, maybe not the specific, specific training that provided, but at least a high level report. So I look forward to speaking with the uh, interim chief regarding that. So um, yeah, I mean, like I said to the inspector, it's, it's, never been more important to start looking internally within, especially especially within our police, police force at systemic racism. So it was um, it was good to see uh, some first steps. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and I'll just add a cup. I don't have to do DRT anymore, thanks to Mr. Norris's presentation, so that's good regarding on-demand and e-tickets. Just finance, we discussed the consolidated budget status report. And this was only until July 31st. And um, the, the deficit then was 13.2 million uh, for the region of Durham. They've received 8.4 million in, um, in provincial and federal funding for stage one. So that leaves just shy of a $5 million deficit. So I'm sure they'll be applying for phase two funding as well as we've just approved. And since nobody spoke to the committee the whole meeting, just we had presentations from the Anti-Black Racism Task Force in Uxbridge. They actually had some good recommendations regarding signage, but we also had a presentation from the region of Durham as well to discuss the creation of a diversity, equity, and inclusion division, um, which as part of that is going to include the establishment of an anti-racism task force with initial focus on anti-black racism. So that's very good to see. Um, and uh, obviously making a lot of progress in that respect across the region. And I look forward to all the groups, uh, including Oxbridge, including Ajax Anti-Black Racism Task Force, including any others working together with the region to improve uh, and remove uh, systemic racism and racism of all, of all sorts across our region and make our communities better. So. That was a good meeting. Any questions on the regional council reports? Actually, sorry, 
moved by Councilor Dias, second by Councilor Crawford, that the Regional Council reports of October 19, 2020 be received for information. Any questions on the reports? Hearing none, those in favor of receipts? I see all hands, that's carried. Moving on to business arising from notice of motion, I will uh, relinquish the chair to Councillor Dyes as I'm named on this first motion to take over chairing the meeting and I'll turn this over to Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a motion uh, that has been brought forward with myself and uh, Mayor Collier, and it is to have our interim uh, economic development uh, manager along with our diversity inclusion coordinator to develop an economic development round table series. And uh, I, I could read the whole thing if you want me to. Do you want me to? <laughs> Uh, what this what this is is I believe that in in this time of our um, of our world of uh, this time in Ajax, uh, it is it is critical to have uh, people around the table so that we can uh, help to encourage our economic development. However, that looks in the future because I'm pretty sure it's going to look a little bit different as we move forward through COVID. Um, and so I think it's critical that we include uh, business people in, in Ajax, but not only just business people, but we have a lot of business, uh, we have business owners and we have business people as residents that, have, that bring a lot to the table. So uh, my, my motion there is that Ajax directs staff to engage in a series of economic development roundtable as part of the new economic development plan that the uh, EDR be managed and supported by the economic development st staff, that economic development staff proactively recruit and promote EDR through the fall of 2020, targeting residents and businesses and industry leaders in Ajax to support the inaugural event in January, 2021. That the EDR series, event series be held quarterly to advise uh, staff on actions and outlines of the economic development plan and discuss matters of importance to local business success, including but not limited to trends, challenges, growth opportunities, uh, job career, job creations in a manner of conductive uh, open dialogue, honest insight and strat strategic uh, development that Ajax Council receive uh, regular updates on the EDR series from economic development staff, providing key observations, recommendations, and outcomes regarding local business matters. I don't know if you'd like to speak with us, Mayor Collier. You're muted. You're muted, Chair. I'm sorry, Councillor Bauer. I think as it's a seconder, I got to go second. Thank you. I'll wait till after the mayor goes. Okay, Mayor Collier. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Just, I won't spend a lot of more time on this. Just, we've been reaching out, the manager of economic development and myself, to a lot of businesses over the last many months, um, starting with a lot of the larger ones and working our way down. But it's impossible to reach all 2,000 businesses in our town. So, I just think this is a great opportunity to get that input. Um, we've been able to share a lot of ideas and a lot of resources with those that we've talked to. And this is uncharted waters for everybody to communicate. And the more that we can share and the more information that we can get uh, will just help us together sort of get through this. So I think it's a great idea. Happy to second it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bauer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Regional Councillor Crawford. I think it's a great motion. I'm very happy to support this. I do have a question. Um, when you were speaking, you did specifically mention the diversity and inclusion coordinator, Natasha. I don't see her mentioned in, in the motion at all, or sorry, not, not her, the position. Did we want to add that? 
I'm sorry, you're absolutely correct. Even as I was reading that, <laughs> I thought, I don't think I see this. But my, yeah, specifically I wanted to add, uh, because I think it's important that this table is a representation of Ajax. And so, yeah, I would, I would be wanting uh, the, economic develop, or the economic development manager to be working uh, with our uh, diversity and inclusion coordinator uh, to develop the group that comes around the table. So I don't know if that's uh, is that a friendly amendment? amendment to item three. I'm sorry, Mayor Collier. Uh, had... and, the, and the diversity inclusion coordinator. Yeah. Actively recruit. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for catching that. Thank you. That's it for me, Chair. Okay. Regional Councilor Lee. Um, not even an amendment, just a comment of just um, I hope during this during this roundtable series, we're also able to look at the importance of frontline staff uh, for these businesses because you know I, it doesn't a day doesn't go by that I don't realize that we're all, while a lot of us have been able to work from home and limit exposure, um, it's the frontline staff that's able to keep a lot of these businesses uh, open even through these hard times. And so I hope there's a way to acknowledge the efforts that they're putting in, and hopefully the compensation that revolves around that. So just. Uh, comment to that. Thank you. Are there any further questions from council? I just had had one question, if you don't mind. And, and it was not really a question so much as just reading through. I, I wasn't really clear on what um, the, the event would be in January that's coming up and what that signifies. Um, I think uh, similar to the uh, the Ajax Anti-Black Racism Task Force, it's going to take a while to uh, go out to the community. We're asking for it to happen uh, through the fall of this year. And so basically uh, the event, I guess in January, would be the announcement of who would be on the committee uh, and possibly they would have already had one meeting. I'm not exactly sure, but I just, we just wanted to be able to give them enough time to be able to go out, do a call out to the community and be able to uh, look at all of those applications and develop uh, a group of people that would be, uh, I guess, introduced would be more of the, the event in January, not event is kind of maybe overstating it, but it would be more of an introduction of the committee or the round table, I should say. Thank you for clarifying that. So I, I'm gonna assume then that that'll give everybody a little bit of time to get to know each other and figure out what the issues are. Cause I would think that hosting one big round table with small, medium and large businesses would be difficult because they have such different needs. Um, however, at some point it, it's great to bring them all together again, but this will give them an opportunity to talk about those those differences too and those challenges. Yeah, and I think that's the important conversation around the table is so that when you have all of those different sized businesses together, you get to understand and appreciate the challenges that each of them have. Uh, I think that we have a, we, I know we have a lot of very smart, intelligent residents out there that are business people that have uh, some really great ideas. We know as, as municipal, we have our own restrictions and sometimes it's just about educating people, creating those champions uh, to, to be able to, to give us good feedback in, in areas that maybe we weren't, we weren't even exploring. So I think it's, uh, I think it's, I, it's, I think it's gonna promote a really good conversation. And uh, you know, four times a year is a lot. That might, that might only be in the beginning part of the year, uh, but they can establish all of that once they get, uh, once they get the, the round table established. Okay, thank you. That'll be great. Anything further? Madam Chair? Yes, Can I have Rob. a recorded vote at the time, uh, Madam Chair? Sorry? Can we have yeah. a recorded vote at the time when you're ready? Sure. Councillor Tyler Moran. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to support this motion and I think it's paramount that we have members of the business community. Uh, Councillor or Regional Councillor Crawford is, is right. We speak to residents every day that have great ideas. And I'm also proud to say that everyone in this council has had jobs in the private sector and three of us still do. And I think that perspective is so important. Right now, I think it's, it's unbelievably important. So I'm really happy that this, this came about and uh, happy that we can do this. Good, uh, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything further? So Mr. Clerk, there has been a request for a recorded vote. 
Thank you. On the resolution before council, please state your position in favor or opposed. Regional Councillor Crawford. In favor. Councillor Bauer. In favor. Councillor Kahn. In favor. Regional Councillor Lee. In favor. Councillor Tyler Morin. In favor. Mayor Collier. In favor. Regional Councillor Dyes. In favor. Thank you. So it's back to you, Mayor Collier. Thank you, Councillor Dyes, for taking over. Uh, moving on to the next item of uh, notice of motion, traffic signal and crosswalk at Fishlock and Harwood Avenue. Councillor Tyler Morin. You're muted. Yes, thank you. Stand by. <laughs> I wanted to speak. So this motion speaks to staff reviewing the intersection, which hasn't been done since 2014. This is uh, certainly not a new concern for the residents that live in the area. We know the intersection is particularly dangerous. And residents have been asking for this for the better part of a decade. Again, it's asking staff to look at it. Uh, the last warrant was done nearly seven years ago. Since then, we all know the Longos Plaza's come in, number three, Harwood, 15-story uh, building is coming, 220-unit condominium. They're going to be directed by that, um, that uh, intersection as well. Pedestrians crossing a 30 meter wide, very busy uh, street. Um, you just have to go there and have a look. So uh, again, at this time, I was just asking for John Grieve, his team, uh, Mr. Romanowski, to uh, to prepare a, a, a report on, the, on so we can actually see what's going on. And uh, I would appreciate um, my council colleagues support on this. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to speak to this? I'll go with Councillor Crawford as a seconder, then Councillor Khan, then Councillor Lee. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that when the town uh, grows and expands at the rate that our town is going, every once in a while you uh, you have to kind of go back and look at at intersections to say, uh, you know, does it fit the warrant? As Councillor uh, Tyler Moran was saying, the area has developed significantly and is continuing to develop. Uh, we still have that ginormous two schools together. Up there, so uh, I think that uh, that doing a review of this intersection is is a really good idea right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councillor Tyler Morin, uh, well, just knowing the and acknowledging the struggles that Councillor Regional Councillor Lee and I have had about the traffic calming and and trying to have stuff initiated for the safety of, of our residents on Williamson and Ward Two, I will happily happily support you in getting something done in this area as it is it, it's very dangerous and um you know and, and likewise you know we, we work together to to help our, uh our residents be safe in our community so i'll happily support this thank you, you. councillor lee um so my only question it's a question to the um, mover of the motion um so unlike um councillor khan and my, our my motion to um for haskell um, this you, you're saying was not studied since 2014. What's what prevents you from just submitting um, uh, a traffic warrant request uh, for this year, for example? What, well, actually, why, why are we specifically going through this motion? Right, actually, that's a good question. That's what I attempted to do. But then uh, for it to come back to, Mayor Collier was speaking to me about this, for it to come back to council as a report, I have to get council approval. So I'm not able to request that. Uh, Mayor Collier, could you expand a bit on that, please? Absolutely. Yeah, the thing, absolutely, you can just request that a, any road go through the warrant system, and that's fine. But when you request a report back from staff, council cannot direct staff. Uh, so in order to get an actual report, it has to go through motion. So that's why oh, this is... Uh, so this is specifically asking for a, a report as opposed to just, just for, a just result from um, the warrant. Yeah, just a report, and then when it comes back, we'll see if it meets the warrants or not. Right. And um, I guess we are, um, if it doesn't meet the warrant, then um, the Ward 1 councillors will then kind of re-examine what that means uh, in terms of presenting it to council, correct? Correct. Great. Oh, so this is just for a report. Sounds good. Thank it you. is. It is. That's all it is at this time. 
Yeah, there's no action here. Just a, just a report, just direction. Okay, anything further? Seeing none, those in favor? That looks unanimous. That's carried, thank you. Moving on to council 2021 remuneration freeze. I'll turn this over to Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Listen, I don't want to read the whole thing. It's very long. In short, it's just asking that um, counselor, the council not receive um, an annual raise for the year of 2021. Um, the reason is, ob is obvious. You know, COVID has affected all residents across the town of Ajax. And um, the last thing council should be looking at is a raise for themselves. Um, every job deserves some sort of performance review. I understand that. But in this case, because of these extenuating circumstances, which I mentioned earlier, we're still part of, uh, just even thinking about giving ourselves a raise uh, should not be top of mind for us, considering the shortfall that we have uh, through our um, capital budget. So um, yeah, um, it's just, um, there's, there's room, there's even room should our neighboring municipalities reduce uh, their pay um, the way Ajax pay has always been set up, it's been an average around, among lakefront municipalities. So the wording at the end there just allows that if there's a reduction in pay, that that be factored in. But under no uh, uncertain circumstances, will be, be will we be receiving uh, even a 0.01% raise um, this year? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawford, do you like to speak to this as a seconder? No, this motion speaks for itself, and I 100% agree with it. Any, um, sorry, one more point, Chair, if, you don't, uh, if I may. Yep, um, it's also, um, important enough that uh, we'll also be introducing this at, at the region um, come the last Wednesday, uh, where you know, Councillor Crawford thought um, having the mayor's uh, second at, at the region would be more impactful, and I couldn't agree more. So we'll be bringing this at the region as well. But for the most part, uh, this one just deals with the Ajax Local Council uh, remuneration. Yeah, it's a hard one to say. Councillor yeah. Tyler Moore, do I see your hand? Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, very happy to support this. Uh, you, you know, we all know people in travel and restaurants and bars and audio production. Everybody's been so affected, live entertainment. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to support this. And um, it'd be nice to see our provincial and federal uh, brothers and sisters do the same, but just throwing that out there. But uh, thanks for bringing this forward and, and very happy to support. Okay, anything further? I'll ask for a recorded vote, Chair. Okay, recorded vote has been called. Just, uh, I'll speak very quickly. And I, I'm absolutely, I, I didn't think of this, but I'm glad it came forward. We've done a number of other things in just earlier through the GGC, we froze all user fees. Um, just this motion speaks not only to salary, but also freezing travel allowance and benefits. So across the board, I think we're setting a very strong example for our other municipal colleagues. I hope I see them, well, it's completely up to them, but I, I hope we see others follow suit. Everybody's struggling, and I think we need to, to do what we can. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if we are in arbitration this, or not arbitration, in uh, review this year for our, for our other staff, but we'll just see where this goes. But right now, I think this is just sort of setting a, a good precedent. So I'll be happy to support it. And the recorded vote's been called, Mr. Chair. Thank you. On the resolution before council, please state your position in favor or opposed. Regional Councillor Lee. In favor. Councillor Bauer. 100% in favor. Regional Councillor Crawford. In favor. Regional Councillor Dyes. In favor. Councillor Kahn. In favor. Councillor Tyler Morin. In favor. Mayor Collier. In favor. That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to our last motion, uh, traffic calming action for Williamson Drive, moved by Councillor Kahn. Turn it over to you, Mr. Kahn. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, you guys know how hard We've been working towards this and uh, what we're asking for is a prelim design and a cost estimate. That's what we're asking for. And I would really appreciate your support. You know what I've been through with this and um, we're gonna vote on this. Um, Mr. Chair, can I ask for a recorded vote as well? Please? Of course. Councillor Lee, do you wish to speak to this? I do, thank you, Chair. And more importantly, it's not even um, what 
um, Councilor Khan and myself have been through, but just what our residents have been through with this. Um, you know, even with this, the lower traffic rates that we saw um, that the um, inspector inspector and Vision Zero had mentioned of just lower traffic rates because of COVID, we still saw a fatal accident. And as a result, it was just a matter of um, bringing that to light and hopefully creating some traffic calming as a result of that. So we would truly appreciate council support on this. The residents across Williamson and Westney would appreciate uh, council support on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Dice. Thank you. So my question to you would have been then, why was it not um, then given or, or referred back to staff to do go through the traffic calming process to see if it does warrant at this time? Um, do you want me to speak to that? Sure. I believe- uh, Did you move referred, it? It was referred from <laughs> July 27th because we were in the middle of the traffic calming warrant process and reviewing. Right. And it was decided to not bring this motion till after the new warrant process, because I don't believe it met the first warrant. So we wanted to go through and see if it met the new warrants. So which, has it gone through the it, new warrants? It has, and it did not meet the warrants, my understanding. So regardless, okay, it didn't meet the traffic warrants, but you still want, you're still asking then for it to go forward. Oh, with a, over to Councillor Khan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we've been working um, very diligently with the Durham Regional Police to monitor traffic over since all through uh, summer to September. And the, the, the traffic calming has worked for that temporary time. When the police officers remove themselves and move to another location, it will restart again. And this is why we're asking to put something in here that can control the speeding and to do some traffic calming. So that needs to really, like I would feel more comfortable it was referred back to staff to look at that issue. Instead, you're asking them to come back with a preliminary design and cost estimate. So first of all, it hasn't gone through a warrant so that we can identify maybe what has to be done and what the options are, but we're going right, right to the solution. And I'm just a little uncomfortable because we don't really know what that solution is. Why don't we, is Mr. Greaves still on the call? Mr. Clerk? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, or I am. John, so, can you just speak to this, whether this has gone through the new warrant process, please? Yes, so uh, using the available data, uh, it has been tested both with the 2015 warrant and the recently approved 2020 warrant. And in both cases, this segment does not meet the warrant for traffic calming. Okay, further Councillor Dice? No, thank you. Uh, Councillor Tyler Moore, I see your hand up again. Thank you, um, Your Worship. Um, so through you to uh, Mr. Greaves, is there a door number three in this scenario? Because, you know, I can already see where this is going. You know, the residents want it. Um, I received a, uh, an email from a resident in Ward 2 who didn't know that happens sometimes. And he spoke about something that kind of stuck in my head. Uh, he showed me photos. I sent it all to Councillor Khan, and he dealt with it from there. Thank you so much. But making a left turn on Hazelden or Hazeldine onto Williamson, he spoke about the lower part of the driveways with the parked cars being blocked. That that which is it, it's not quite off topic because it's in that same area, but it, but if the if the the street needs you know some TLC or a little bit of action in some way, is it a question of you know we either do it or we don't? There's nothing to be done. Is there something that the local councilors can submit to staff saying, look, we have A, B, and C problem, or is it? You know, if it doesn't happen tonight, then you just walk away for the next three years. Like, uh, is there a door number three, Mr. Grief? Um, th through the chair to Councillor Tyler Moore. Um, specifically related to your, your comment about uh, vehicles potentially blocking sight lines at an intersection, uh, that in my eyes, that would be a completely different conversation. That would be a sight line issue. However, uh, he did speak about night. the, sorry, he, uh, in the in email, and I'll, I'll let you go, I, I just want to correct myself. He spoke about the curvature of the street being particularly dangerous and with cars speeding through there. 
the local councillors probably can envision that area better than the rest of us, but just to make the, so sorry, go ahead. So uh, as I was saying, um, the, uh, you know, a, a sight line issue at an intersection is something that is completely different than what we're speaking about to this motion here. Here we're talking about uh, traffic calming uh, on a road segment. Um, so, um, you know, that sight line issue brought up by that resident, well, it's something we can look into. Uh, I don't think it's specifically related to this motion and motion about traffic calming. Right, he also brought up wanting a stop sign there as well. So um, it wasn't just that. Thank you. Anything further? Councilor Crawford? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, from the report previous, uh, I think that uh, Councilor Khan brought up a very good idea around with the school opening, probably, uh, I would say probably by January, the way it's it's moving, uh, that this area definitely, and I, I don't know if this is um, an amendment or whatever, but, uh, that, but that this area should be uh, uh, looked at for to become a community safety zone so that uh, our automated speed enforcements can definitely, uh, I think would provide much, a much more effective way of slowing down cars than, uh, than speed bumps personally. But um, I don't know how that, how does that work in, to, is that a completely different motion or, cause it's not really a friendly amendment. It's kind of like changing everything all over again. But I did really like the suggestion that mm -hmm. Councillor uh, Khan had brought up. I would suggest that that would be a separate motion is completely unrelated to the ask in the therefores on this one. But I'm open to the clerk's interpretation. Through you, Mr. Mayor, it um, might be wise to consult with Mr. Grieve or Mr. Romanowski about uh, criteria for community safety zones and determine whether it would be appropriate to amend the last resolution to include reporting back on whether or not this area might qualify to become a community safety zone. I just see one problem um, with that, and that is if this motion does not pass, which I don't know if it will or not. So amending it, a motion that does not pass is not going to help. Right. Okay, forward. I, I, I withdraw. We do a, a separate yeah. motion for that. I withdraw the whole thing, sorry. Um, and and that way, if, uh, if this doesn't pass, then it's open for another motion, correct? Right. Okay. I'll just withdraw. Well, not at this, but it's it's open for another motion to come forward once that school is open. And it, and I I'm pretty sure that Mr. Grieve has probably taken this as as direction <laughs> to look at that area for um, a community safety zone. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to uh, muddy the water. No, nope, that's okay. Anything further on this before I speak to it? Uh, I'll allow Councillor Bauer and then Councillor Khan to finish up. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for this motion, Councillors Khan and Lee. So is this area along the same strip from the previous report that was presented tonight that, that also failed the warrant? It's the other side. The other side. Okay. So, and Councillor Bauer, through the Chair, this is from Bellinger from the roundabout to Westing Road, whereas the other part we were talking about was from Bellinger, the roundabout, west to Ravenscroft Road. Going, so going the other way, okay. And um, when this section of road went through the new warrant, Mr. Reeve mentioned it did not, um, it was not eligible, was the finding similar to the findings of that other report. Mr. Grieve? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Rauer, uh, yes, that's correct. The findings were uh, related to the 85th percentile speed that was observed was, did not meet minimum thresholds. Okay, so it was under, drivers fell under the speed limit. Fell under the threshold. So the, in the traffic calming warrant, there's a minimum criteria for the 85th percentile speed. Uh, the section to the west, they were 49 and 47. Uh, this section is 53, so slightly higher. However, with a posted speed of 50, um, 
In order to be eligible, you would have to have an 85th percentile speed of at least 60. This section had a, a 85th percentile speed of 53. Thank you. So, and we just passed a brand new traffic calming warrant that I think everybody, it was passed unanimously. And I think everyone was excited about the increase of um, locations to be um, hit or warranted um, and the um, increase of the, sorry, the decrease of time in between retesting a segment. Um, so I, I thought we were all um, pretty happy about that, or, um, with that improvement, but this motion seems to say to me, forget about all that hard work and, and all the stuff we agreed on and let's just go forward and put a speed hump, um, which I completely understand. Uh, your residents want one, you want to give your residents what they want, but I, I have a hard time um, directing that we spend money that we are struggling not to spend in a COVID budget year on stuff that our professional warrants determine we don't require. So I will not be supporting this motion uh, with all due respect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Khan. I saw your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to bring to light that while this traffic calming measure or why this traffic, um, the radar, whatever you were using to do your warrant was being done, I was also working diligently for the safety of our residents on Williamson in Ajax with the Durham Regional Police who were constantly patrolling that road within that same time because I couldn't just depend for, your, for the warranting to, to protect the residents of Ajax. So this was happening at the same time which would have countered and which would have enhanced the traffic calm. What I'm trying to say is that the police officers will not always be there and need something a little more, something a little more permanent to help curb what happens on that street. That's what I'm trying to explain. But when, whilst that warrant was being done by the town staff, we were working with the Durham Regional Police on that area, which would have, which would have canceled out their warrant. I just want to make that in the light right now. Thank you. Okay, further. I'll just finish it off then. I, I will, with all respect to all the speakers and, and all good points, but speed and poor driving are issues on every street in Ajax. And we all have our streets that have issues and we have concerns with, and all of our kids are important and all of our residents are important and, and all the rest. So that's why traffic warrants were developed because we have a finite amount of money for traffic calming and we needed a method to make sure that every section of road across the town where we have a traffic issue is looked at fairly and equally and measured against these warrants so we can funnel that money to those roads that are most in need. And this, this section of road has twice failed those traffic warrants. So if we just go ahead and even though we've gone through the process that everybody's accepted and try and push something through, that is really doing a disservice to every other resident and every other piece of road in the town that has a higher standing based on these warrants that we had all unanimous, unanimously approved. Not to mention this is not budgeted, um, you know, and, and we are in trying times. So I, I, I can't support this. I did support the crosswalk at Haskell at our last meeting because it did meet the warrants. And, and you know, that threshold had been crossed. But in this case, if we're gonna go ahead and put politically motivated, and I don't say that disrespectfully, but just if it doesn't meet the warrant, just politically push things through it kind of asks the question, why do we need warrants and why do we need staff recommending us if we're going to ignore staff's recommendation? So, uh, and again, respectfully, I absolutely get it. We all have these areas, but we do have to follow the rules. And so I, I can't support this one. So I'll be voting no. Thank you. Councillor Dice. 
Thank you. I just want to speak to the motion then. I had the question previously, but um, I agree with uh, Mayor Collier and uh, Councillor Bauer. You know, the number one thing we heard of in, in, in the election, all of us heard, was the safety on our streets, speeding. And the other thing was taxes. And so we have this process so we can look at, you know, the most vulnerable areas, the ones that need some, some kind of traffic calming done as a high priority, medium, low priority kind of thing. They're all very, very important. We don't want to see any accidents. However, we can't possibly give everybody everything they want because you can't afford it, basically. It doesn't mean it's not important. But there also has to be a process that says, hey, you know, maybe there's another way to do this or, or you know, maybe what you perceived as a speeding car wasn't necessarily so. Yes, police aren't going to be there all the time. Um, but I think it's very important that we have a process that we go through to determine what needs to be done first and where those tax dollars go in each given year to, to do those projects. I, I, you know, when I'm asked by, you know, people that live in my area, I can't promise them everything and give them everything. And I'm very honest and open with them about that. And, and I think with, with this, safety is paramount, of course, but so is responsibility when you're driving a car. And, and I think that's another issue that we need to talk about more and more. People really have to slow down and, and take some responsibility for their driving. So I, I will not be supporting this motion, but I feel your pain. <laughs> Record a vote was called for, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before we conduct the recorded vote, I just want to make a note for members on the final provision of this uh, motion. This is printed in this agenda verbatim from the motion that was deferred from July 27th. So you'll note that it says if, if this were to pass, that it would be a report back to Council at the September GGC. Uh, logic would dictate that this would read the December GGC if it were to pass tonight. Fair enough. On the resolution before council, please state your position in favor or opposed. Councillor Kahn. In favor. Councillor Bauer. Opposed. Regional Councillor Crawford. Opposed. Regional Councillor Dyes. Opposed. Regional Councillor Lee. In favor. Councillor Tyler Morin. Opposed. Mayor Collier. Opposed. That motion lost on a 5-2 vote. Thank you. Moving on to bylaws, we have two bylaws. Moved by Councillor Bauer, second by Councillor Tyler Morin. The bylaw numbers 40-2020 and 41-2020 be read a first, second, third time and passed. And these are bylaws with one freezing our fees and two extending the outdoor patio permitting for restaurants. Any questions or comments? Councillor Bauer? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to um, comment, I guess. You've mentioned a few times during the meeting about freezing our fees, but I believe that we, did, we didn't freeze all of them. So I just thought we should clarify that not all of the fees were frozen, only yeah. some of them. Correct. The municipal um, uh, index would automatically increment a lot of the fees up by uh, something similar to inflation. We have kept all those as is. So none of those fees are incremented by the MPI. But you are correct. There are some new fees that are in there to do with uh, other certain, certain things that we had already approved as a council prior. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that was stated so that if someone did enc encounter a fee that had was either new or increased that they would understand that it, that why. So Correct. thank you. Yeah. Anything further on that? Seeing none, those in favor? I see all hands. That's carried. Do we have any notices of motion? Do we have any new business notices or announcements? I saw Councillor Lee and Councillor Tyler Warren. Um, just a reminder to all EJAX residents that are watching, 
that, um, yes, Halloween may be in jeopardy as a result of COVID, but the town of Ajax is doing Pumpkinville, the drive through getaway at the Oddly Rec Center. So all you have to do is go to ajax.ca slash town events to register. And there um, you'll see uh, uh, time slots for you to register to do a drive by. There's gifts and goodies for the kids. Uh, but most importantly, I'm going to call this out. Um, so Poonam Swift, who is our uh, coordinator for events, she has the best costumes. So last year for Pumpkinville, she showed up as a poo emoji. And this one in the promo video showed up as Snow White. So if nothing else, hopefully she'll be out there uh, in costume uh, for us, to, for anyone to take pictures with, uh, socially distance, of course. So Pumpkinville is um, next Wednesday. Hope to see you guys there. Thank you, Councilor Tyler Morin. Thank you, Worship. Um, Regional Councilor uh, Marilyn Crawford and I are having our first, uh, well, no, actually we had one in, uh, in August. We're having a ward meeting. Um, community issues are gonna be coming up. It's the virtual ward meeting that is. It's October 21st, coming up this week at 7 p.m. It'll be online via Zoom. And if you'd like to join, uh, send a note to ajax.ca uh, the information will be on there. We've also shared it on our social medias as well. Um, and the Town of Ajax Facebook page and our Twitter account. So I hope to see uh, a good turnout on October 21st at 7 p.m. Thank you, Councilor Bauer. Thank you, Chair. So when everyone has had a lovely time at Pumpkinville next Wednesday, they can stay home and tune in next Thursday, the 29th for the Ward 3 meeting that will be hosted by Regional Councillor Dyes and I also on Zoom. So there will be some notice going out about that on social media, uh, advertising and with the information to register. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. And also an attempt to support local restaurant, uh, we have the new bingo card that has been launched. Uh, where we have a list of local restaurants uh, to all of your liking online and you get a bingo card and you, every restaurant that you visit or you take out or you pick up, uh, curbside pickup, uh, you mark that off on your bingo card. And I don't actually know what your reward is, to be honest, if you do get a bingo, maybe you get a free meal, I don't know. Maybe somebody else can help me, but get it's, your bingo it's, card. It's a $50 gift certificate to oh, any one of those restaurants. Go. There you go. You See? enter. You get entered into a draw. Right, and then you can win yes. a fifty dollars. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So my announcement was pretty bad, but get your bingo card. I would think just the personal satisfaction would be worth it. There we go. Uh, anything other under announcements, Councillor Dyes? Please. Thank you. I just wanted to congratulate um, Community Development Council Durham, CDCD, for 50 years. It's their 50th anniversary here in Ajax. They're situated on uh, right down here where the Welcome Center is on Station Street across from the GO Station. Um, they started out as a planning council and over time have taken on many, many programs that assist in many areas in our community where there's gaps and needs. So I just wanted to thank them for all the work they've done. They're the lead on the Homelessness Task Force here in Ajax, and they, they work collaboratively, collaboratively with the region and a lot of other not-for-profits in the area. So congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Job well done. Thank you. Congratulations. And Councillor Lee, I find it difficult that you're going to be able to pop your pumpkin, you're going to be able to top your pumpkinville yeah, I, 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 did, I should have timed this better. So also, uh, now that I'm going to talk about ward meetings, um, in the words of Vanessa Williams, we're going to save the best for last. So November 19th at 7 p.m. is the Ward 2 uh, uh, Town Hall with Councillor Khan and myself. Uh, details, I assume, will be uh, on ajax.ca. We haven't really worked it out yet. But it's a month from now, so we'll see you guys then. Well, in the words of Vanessa Williams, we're going to save the best for last. And I'm going to announce the... Live with the mayor next on November the 4th. Uh, it's gonna be broadcast live from St. Francis Center and special guests are gonna be Honorable Rod Phillips, Minister of Finance, Dr. Robert Kyle, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Simon Gill, Director of Economic Development and Tourism at the region and Amazon Canada. And that will all be done. I'll be the only one live. Everybody else will be Zooming in. So it'll be all the social distance. That will be at 7 p.m. And there will be more details on all the social media channels. Anything further? 
All right, moving on to the confirming bylaw, moved by Councillor Lee, second by Councillor Crawford, that bylaw number 42-2020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Ajax at this regular meeting held on October 19, 2020, be read a first, second, third time and passed. Question comments on the confirming bylaw? Being none, those in favor? That's enough, that's carried. And moving on to adjournment, moved by Councillor Crawford, second by Councillor Kahn, to the October 19, 2020 meeting of the Council of the Town of Ajax be adjourned. Those in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much.